One Brave Idea project that uh, started last AHA. I uh, would like to give you a brief overview of where uh, we have gone since the idea came up. This is Dr. Fuster's slide, so switch to my slide. Um, as you know, AHA, Google, AstraZeneca uh, selected Dr. Uh, McKay's project as a project choice, but there has been an enormous amount of uh, interest in this unique idea of going after the vulnerable patient and utilizing a machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, all of these artificial uh, network, neural network, to attack the problem that really has been uh, in cardiology for a century, and that is near-term risk prediction. Whether we're able to identify those people who are going to have an event in the next few months, few weeks, few months, maximum a year. That's where we focus our project. We went on, as I said, submitted our project to the One Brave Idea. We specifically titled our project Machine Learning Heart Attack Alert System or Forecast System. And the goal is not just identification, but also opening path for developing new therapeutic targets. We are, as I was just telling Dr. Fuster, approaching multiple uh, potential partners in funding source. This is a very unique project. In fact, there is no way to do this project prospectively. You would need somewhere around 20 to 50 million people follow them for five years to come to the kind of sample size that we're collecting or aiming to collect. So we approached Google, Apple, <coughs> Facebook, which was the most recent one. Uh, actually, after Facebook, we uh, made contact with IBM Watson. Some of you might know IBM Watson because it's, <coughs> an amazing uh, uh, era, open an amazing era in computer uh, world. You know, they were the first to bring computer and counting by machine uh, 100 years ago or so. And then they were the first to bring the novel computer that we worked in the past 30 years or so. And now they're the first to bring cognitive computing, which is basically brain similar to what human's brain does, learns and develop uh, uh, training for itself. So the focus for most of you have been with our uh, movement of shape for over 10 years, been identifying what precedes the event. For almost a decade, we focused on vulnerable plaque. We realized that we needed to move beyond vulnerable plaque to vulnerable patient, and the vulnerable patient has plaque, blood, and myocardium components. There's a video on SHAPE website uh, for people who will uh, access our presentation online, which is uh, by far the largest part of the audience for this meeting. We have about an average five to 10,000 uh, viewers for this meeting. Uh, so that's why we conduct our meeting online on webinar format and enable them to access these uh, <coughs> slides and uh, videos. Post that uh, concept of going to vulnerable patient, which uh, uh, received a lot of support. Of course, Dr. Uh, Fuster and Dr. Willerson uh, at that time were mentors that uh, helped me develop this, Dr. Falk, and um, I also had help from Peter Libby to put this together. This was number one. Uh, then we 
publish number two quickly after that from vulnerable plaque to vulnerable patient. And then it took us several years because we didn't really have an easy way to go about identifying the vulnerable patient. And in the sort of land of blind, we found the one eye uh, to be the king, and that became coronary calcium. Coronary calcium through many meetings. Uh, this was the hallmark of meeting. You see Wolfgang going over there, running fog. This was a closed door event where we had to throw um, uh, shoes at each other to get through some of the basic agreements. And finally, we came up with the guidelines that named itself the SHAPE Guidelines. Again, at that time, this is 10, almost 10 years ago, 2006, and uh, exactly 10 years ago, we uh, didn't have the evidence that we do today, uh, heavily supporting the value of subclinical atherosclerosis and coronary calcium. But that was our uh, sort of general idea. And uh, over years, we took a lot of uh, bullets, uh, particularly uh, people who are in this picture. And um, here's one. That's Zahi, uh, who's on the far left in this picture. Everybody took bullets for this stand. And I think um, we are in a place where we can say uh, the, the body of evidence for uh, coronary calcium and the approach that SHAPE took uh, is now accepted. We don't have a formal concession uh, from AHACC that this is the way to go, but pretty much everybody realized the value of coronary calcium and what SHAPE put out. But as I said, when the one brave idea came up, we seized the opportunity to go after what SHAPE is about, and that is truly identifying the vulnerable patient. We know that coronary calcium brought a significant amount of predictive value, but it is far from uh, our ideal test. So um, that project of machine learning vulnerable patient is going to complement what we uh, need to see in this picture. This is the circle that we're going. So coronary calcium covers this, and you will hear from presentation of uh, Dr. Kaka Diaris that we will be even looking at vulnerable calcification as a possible pattern that we can recognize. And then we will we have a lot of uh, homework to do with vulnerable blood, which is part of this project and proposal, and then vulnerable myocardium. So that is the uh, machine learning project. The next announcement that I have, I was just getting permission from Dr. Fuster to break this to you. Um, you know IBM Watson made history by uh, beating world champion in Jeopardy. Um, and that news uh, really for the first time opened everybody's eyes to the value of cognitive computing and how uh, that can revolutionize many fields, which is coming. The, the, the wave and the tsunami is coming. We haven't gotten there yet, but I believe the same approach that was taken with Jeopardy five years ago, 2011, <coughs> can be taken in cardiology, and we want to be in medicine generally, but we want to be the first in medicine, cardiology, to do machine versus cardiologist. This idea came after my uh, uh, visit of ACC uh, FIT fellows in training Jeopardy this year, talked to the ACC, talked to the people there, and we're going to uh, hopefully uh, get IBM Watson uh, to participate in this project. So imagine here is our best fellows who literally swallowed these textbooks and are answering all questions at the speed of light. And then here we hope that we will have our Dr. Watson. And so this is a project that 
is aiming at 2020, 2020 to be launched live at ACC. And um, I could not think of a better uh, avatar than Dr. Rooster. If you haven't seen Dr. Rooster, I introduce you to the man who uh, I call my mentor and uh, has had a difficult time mentoring me because the distance and that I'm not quite listening, but I believe a Dr. Rooster versus cardiology isn't cooking and can be realized within, as I said, 20, by 2020. Uh, we had some discussions that it could be even earlier. Just knowing that Watson can read 800 million pages per minute. Now, we don't have 800 million pages in cardiology textbook, but reading the textbook, putting the context together, a lot of case and samples is a plan. So this is my uh, unannounced announcement. I just got the permission from Dr. Fuster to uh, pursue this. This will be somewhat uh, uh, out of uh, one of a patient topic, but it is well within the scope of bringing machine learning to patient care. With that, I'm going to go back to uh, the topic of this meeting and summarize what uh, we're going to hear tonight. We're going to hear discussions about this project, participant cohorts that are here, some of the representative and some who are not here and will participate later. Uh, I had a very good discussion with Dr. Levy from Framingham Heart Study. Uh, he had to leave, but we spent about an hour discussing some of the details. And then we'll hear from other people who are going to participate in this study. As I was just telling Dr. Fuster about our uh, approach to uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Watson, uh, IBM, he brought to uh, my attention that he had also discussions with them. So Dr. Fuster has some slides to uh, share with you. And then after that, I'd like to pass the podium to our moderator, Dr. Marin and Dr. Narula for uh, a brief introduction from their point of view, how they see machine learning. I know Dr. Marin gave a talk yesterday about machine learning and baseline study, and Dr. Narula has been following this for a long time uh, from the site. So uh, without further ado, please, Dr. Narula, take it away. Dr. Mayor, a few minutes, and then Dr. Fuster's the slides coming up. Mayor, first. Any comments? Any? Uh, yes. Uh, have you already gone around the room work with? Uh, that was that was your. <coughs> that's what you were going. Oh, you, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I'll, I'll start it. I'm, I'm David Marin. Uh, yes, Barry is my cousin. Uh, if you were wondering. Um, He's the, the famous Marin. Um, I'm a preventive cardiologist at Stanford, and I'm a total novice when it comes to machine learning. Um, I'm, I, I'm just at, at the right place at the right time to uh, be involved in this great idea. Um, Stanford will be the coordinating center for organizing the uh, collection and analysis of biospecimens. And um, that's, that's my primary uh, role for participating in this, uh, in this study. Um, Mort, I don't know if we, yeah, I why, why don't we go around the room? Yes. What do you think? Yanis Gagapiaris, University of Houston. I'm fighting with uh, medicine and food engineering out of Japan. I'm on the director of preventive cardiology, Michi Southwestern, and I work in the Dallas Service. 
Martin Mortensen from Aarhus University in Denmark. Erling Fink from Aarhus University in Denmark. Are we going to uh, public health at the Washington Institute of National Development? The undergraduate is at Cardiology Methodist Hospital in Maryland, Maryland. Wonderful. More Nagavi here. And sorry, that was a bad director of research, John Hopkins, particularly set of prevention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Ahmed Ghul, Rising Shape Society intern, working with Dr. Yes. Nagavi on his project. Uh, it's lovely to have you all here. Um, fascinated. You guys are all my role models, and hopefully I'm pursuing medicine in the future, future cardiologist, hopefully. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for Ahmed's support. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Pusters, the slide is off. The meeting will be after Dr. Pusters' presentation. We'll be in a dynamic mode. We have a very featured presentation uh, by our machine learning guru, uh, Dr. Kakadiaris. And then we'll go into very much of a back and forth. Dr. Pusters. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, basically, uh, I was asked to make a presentation of my meeting with the head of the Watson, who we had a debate a week ago uh, yeah, about uh, the future of uh, what they are doing. It was a significant debate between technology and education. And I'm going to present to you how things went and how I see these enterprises, Google and, and then uh, IBM, uh, which works with Apple and so forth. Basically, uh, my presentation was based, uh, we had eight minutes each. Um, my presentation was based into what I think I see the future, which is we have to divide the population in different ages. We cannot just talk in general, because this has been our problem from the very beginning. The science of a people between age 50 and 100 is completely different the subclinical disease between 25 and 50, and to the very early stages between birth and age 25. And the approach, this is basically science, and the educational tools to really have the receiver, the consumer, to change behavior is completely different depending on the ages. Now, here comes Google and IBM are very much concentrated here. And this is the first problem. And basically, what I will show you in a moment is how we are moving and how I see them moving. Their main interest has been cancer and brain. So cardiology has not been their main interest. And this came very open in the discussion with both, actually, with Google as well as with IBM. And I'm going to elaborate a little more. Yeah. Can you take that? No, no, no. I just take it out. Does that come out? Yeah. You can. That's a strange, but that doesn't matter. Well, here's the situation. Um, what we are doing is that uh, this is not supposed to be here, I don't know why. But what we are doing and what I presented is our approach. And our approach is basically to move from this stage, which could be age 50 to 100, secondary prevention in people who are rather stable, and we are talking about health rather than disease, to 25 to 50, which is people who are actually um, uh, subclinical disease, and then to talk about the early stages. Uh, I don't know what happened with the slide. It's a little bit mixed up, but I will tell you their process. The TANSNIP is a project that we try to work between age 50 and 100. It's basically identify degenerative brain disease through imaging and correlate this with large vessel disease. And the imaging in large vessel disease is 3D ultrasound. 
and calcification of the coronary arteries. And in the brain, it's certainly MRI in positive emission tomography. There's a lot of data, very strong data, suggesting that the same risk factors that affect the large arteries also affect the tiny arteries of the brain. And actually, it's interesting because a paper presented here, the, the HOPE 3 study, is actually uh, going to get into the brain and, uh, and whether cognitive function in people with hypertension and people with high cholesterol levels can actually be improved or, or at least to delay the progression of this arteriolar disease with the use of statins and antihypertensive therapy. Is, the, is this paper has been presented here or not yet? The, the trial yes. Yes. has been presented. Very interesting. In fact, 70% of the people didn't have hypercholesterolemia and they were not hypertensive. And those who had hypercholesterolemia and hypertensive, you can see the tremendous strength how you can prevent the progression of the cognitive dysfunction. I'm just presenting this because the message is it doesn't work, mm -hmm. when in fact, they are working with normal people. So this is a very important. The second project that we have at that age is the polypill. As you know, this polypill is the first one that has been approved uh, now in 27 countries for secondary prevention. These are people with small heart attacks and strokes. And we have at this moment three prospective studies, not looking at adherence of a polypill better than taking all the pills following the stroke of myocardial infarction. We are looking now whether we can prevent recurrences of events. There are three projects now that we are having prospectively with the polypill. It is already approved, and I'm going to the FDA in two months for approval here in the United States. This is a combination of a statin, an ACE inhibitor, and aspirin. This is a second approach. This is in the elderly. Here comes, what I think you might be interested, is the projects that are between age 25 and 50. What are our concerns are is subclinical disease. And can these people with subclinical disease change behavior if you show the arteries to them? This is the real question. And we have three studies now already published which actually is, um, is a study of 12,000 people now that we have with 3D ultrasound and calcification. And we are seeing very interesting things, and that is the predictability of subclinical disease, the burden of disease, is actually higher than Framingham. But this doesn't mean this is in a short period of follow-up. Why? Because the highest risk is to have the disease already. This is the risk factor that is the worst. So we will have that correlation. And this is one thing. Now, the question is, can we change behavior? And this is really, it's a pity, the slide really involves education is this. Can we change behavior? And what we are beginning to show is that the adults only change with the community. And that is working with the community is like a, a mental issue. You have to work, of, 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 you know, in, in your setting, in your family and so forth, then you can change behavior. Otherwise, it's very difficult. And we have two projects. This is like Alcohol Anonymous, groups of 10 that help each other in terms of their health. Uh, and this is more directly to the patient. And this leads also educationally to the last two projects that actually are quite interesting is in children. We are now following 75,000 children. And all started in Colombia. All, all are randomized studies, by the way. There's no study I'm presenting that is descriptive here, none. So and those in children, this randomization started in Colombia, and what we have found is between age three to six is the time to really the great window of opportunity. Whatever we teach to a child at last. We have now a nine year follow-up with the Colombia project. We are looking at this, a three years of follow-up, the intervene group is 70 hours of teaching health to these children, how the body works, exercise, how to control the emotions, preparing them to avoid uh, the use of tobacco later in age. And our goal is at age 20 to demonstrate that what we did at age 3 to 5 has an impact. And this is now 75,000 children altogether that are in, in, in several parts of the world with different randomization types of progress. And now, since we have this, this is would be the grandfather, this is the father, and this is the child, we have two main projects. One is the Familia project, which is in Harlem, 600 families, and we are doing exactly what I'm presenting to you, but in a family setting, mm -hmm. to see which one of the processes, diagnostic as well as educational, has the greatest impact. And the other is in Mexico. The government of Mexico just called us two months ago, and basically the Minister of Health wants all these projects in Mexico, all of them, as a priority of health 
in Mexico moving to Estelle. I presented this, and then the, uh, the, the head, the new, new head of Watson is uh, Deborah Di Sanso. This is, has been in Watson for uh, two months. It was quite of a contrast because what she really presented was huge amount of data. Let's say they look into an individual, in particularly 50 to 100, that's the problem. They are not going to much earlier. And they present a lot of data, genetic and so forth, and saying the, actually the robot is going to tell what is the diagnosis and what is the best treatment. That's basically what Watson is all about. Their main focus, their main focus is cancer. And then now they realize that the brain is important and they want to get into imaging. They got into imaging by the brain, not because of the heart. And that's what they made this recent merger. So uh, we presented two completely points of view because that point of view is descriptive. But my point of view, can you go to the, to the first slide? The previous one. I have the previous one. This is critical. This is my discussion, and that is you can have all the technology in the world, but who is the receiver? These people can come with a fantastic technology, but it's going to be adherence by the patient. It's going to be reliability by the doctor, and they don't have any idea, which is where the educational process is failing in these companies. So I think what we achieve is, first of all, it appears that Google is coming back to us on the children aspect of education. Mm -hmm. And certainly IBM is very interested to really take what I presented to you on the left side that is very educational. And that is what tools could we use once they have all this descriptive data. So I have very little to say, but how this organization can really fit with all these other organizations, it has to be uh, a significant change. I think the, um, and the change has to be on the educational side. You can present all the technology in mm -hmm. the world, but if there is not really and uh, uh, that this is not applicable to the patient uh, in, a, in, a very, in a very significant way, this will all fail. And therefore, I think what I'm really okay. telling you, that if you don't have, you can have all the technologies that you want on imaging, but has to be an applicability, it has to be adherence, and has to be, this is basically what I got. So you're saying even if we accomplish their goal, this massive job of identifying characteristic of the vulnerable patient, and once we tell people that you're a vulnerable patient, whether they follow, they adhere, and how much of that translate to outcome is a question. This has been a huge issue. Everybody talks technologically without taking into account the problem we have found in all of our projects is the consumer, the patient. That is, doesn't follow whatever you do. And, and I think this is really a critical issue. So I think that if you have to have an impact with these big enterprises, in my view, has to be on an educational side. Because in the technological side, they will listen to you, but, you know, we already have the technology. So I think that this is a critical, at least I give you the critical Thank tool you. by the cardiovascular community has to be educational. Don't try to sell anything technologically because they will not listen to you. That's the, that's the way as I'm coming out from all of this. Thank you. So, you know, Dr. Fuster, when we brought this idea first for the one brave idea, one of the points that came up was that knowing somebody's risk, you know, 50% or higher of events within 12 months can trigger actions. Whereas when you give people 20 years or 50 years or lifetime risk, it doesn't trigger psychologically it doesn't trigger they, if you tell them that in 30 years you're going to have a 30 percent or 20 percent chance of event versus you tell them in the next six months you have a 50 percent or higher chance of having an event that triggers psychologically actions and whatever else that we, we will have very, i don't know it's very we hard it's very hard i can tell you all of our projects that we have worked over the last 10 years, this has to do of what impact you have on the patient. It's very hard. And what, what we are finding is that the, the best receiver is the child. There's no question about it. It's the one that retains what you say and moves in the same direction that you actually make. And in the adults, one thing we are running, and actually we had, Samir was there this morning, 
there were five presentations about work of how to change the adults, all show the same thing to the community. If you don't have partners, if you don't have communities, we as individuals do not change. I, I love your idea of family-based innovation. Well, it's, it's a critical issue. Yeah, because, you know, just like you said, usually there's mother in the family that takes care of, you know, the man mm -hmm. and herself and the children. Uh, if you focus on family, and then provide this kind of actionable information. Because if we just do the same thing that AHA or NACC have done for you know, 50 years, we're going to get the same thing that they have got. I think we have to change. I have to tell you, uh, if we don't go into his or her brain, anything we can do will be descriptive and will fail. This is my view. That, you know, when you realize in the freedom <coughs> trial, that only 20% of people with coronary disease and diabetes were taking the drugs that were supposed to take 20%, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get into that, you can have all the technology in the world to try to solve the problem. You will not solve the problem. And this is what I see. And actually, she saw this very clearly. You should see the beginning of the conversation with her in the end. In fact, I'm meeting with her next week because now she wants to start working on the educational aspect, which is what these companies are really failing. So my advice to you, with all the technologies that you have, try to sell something that really can change, that can click, can click into the patient, into the consumer. This is to me the key. Otherwise, these companies will not listen. This is my view. Thank you. I think, Dr. Vizasoy, you know, I saw a presentation in one of these, uh, I don't know, it was IBM or something. They actually developed an app that takes a picture of the pill and takes a picture of the patient taking the pill and registers and is a tool to improve adherence. <laughs> so that 20% that you said in freedom trial is probably going to be affected by these kind of technology. I would like to transition our, uh, I mean, that was a pretty uh, sobering call you just made. But I think our next presenter is going to tell us where machine learning and incorporating this gigantic tool in many aspects of life, not just in data mining for risk prediction, there can be some new hopes and new uh, grounds. Without further ado, I'll give you Dr. Kakadiaris. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, to see old friends and make new friends. Dr. Fuster, thank you for the challenge. Uh, you invalidate my whole talk, but that's okay. I take the challenge uh, of how we can take this work uh, of what I was planning to do today, give you a short primer on what is machine learning and how I think it can disrupt the survival analysis and make me think how Machine learning can disrupt the educational paradigm. Thank you for the challenge, Dr. Fuster. But before we proceed further, let's go down the memory lane. And let's see if you remember this. Of course, Mort gave it out, so it will be easy for you. You can start the video. Romantic Russian composed Etude Tableau for piano. Watson, who is Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff is correct, and that adds to your lead. You're at 13,400. And not only that, but a few months ago in March 2016, you can see that uh, you know the DeepMind artificial intelligence system basically was used to win the final match in the Go series against the world champion. So there's a lot of buzz around about artificial intelligence, correct? Uh, in IBM, I guess they like to say it as automated intelligence. Uh, so what is artificial intelligence? In a nutshell, artificial intelligence is the science of developing intelligent machines and it attempts to improve or mimic the cognitive functions that humans perform, such as learning and so on. And a branch of artificial intelligence is machine learning. And machine learning, what 
strives to do is to improve the performance through experience, data, and learning. So basically, it's a method for teaching computers to make predictions based on data. Notice the key word there, data. I really like this cartoon. It basically demonstrates the idea that our algorithm becomes better as we get more and more data. And you know, this is what Dr. Fuster, Fuster talked about. It's not machine learning is not to be confused for statist with statistics. It's two different disciplines. Machine learning, uh, you are dealing with high dimensional data, more than a hundred dimensions. And you're looking to find structure in domains where a single statistical model will not be adequate. You're trying to model domains where you have complicated underlying structure. If you are wondering if you use machine learning, I will tell you that your email provider already uses machine learning for spam filtering. If you follow the recommendations of Netflix for watching a movie, then you have been a beneficiary of machine learning. Whether you check the forecast today about the amount of rainfall, that's another area. But let's see how this works. Let's think of a specific problem. Okay. We have data and we have labels, the prediction outcome. Then the technologist will develop features and will train a model. But let's be a little bit specific. Suppose I want to find out and develop a trained model that will tell me if a specific email is spam or not. How do I go about it? Well, I have to give a lot of examples, but not only examples, but the labels. So I give an example email, and I give the label spam or not spam. And based on this information, I can develop a trained model. Once I have this trained model, when I have a new datum, then I can give you the same prediction. So emails arrive into your email provider, the trained model is used to decide whether this is spam or not, and then send it to your inbox or to your junk filter. I know maybe I'm getting too much uh, into details, but there are actually four types of machine learning that I want you to be aware. The spam filtering is what is called supervised machine learning. The idea there is you have data and you have the labels. You have data for set the emails and labels whether it's spam or not. But there is also the unsupervised machine learning. For example, suppose that you want to find out what's, what are the most common tweets. You can use unsupervised machine learning to cluster these areas. Or in some examples, in some cases, you have examples where you have labels. Let's say that you have some city exams where you have the labels about classification, but you have exams where you don't have these labels. Then you can call it semi-supervised machine learning. And my favorite example is reinforcement learning, which is basically learn a policy that will help us improve the outcome. And I don't know if you have seen this movie about teaching robots to walk. I'll play it just for your benefit. Okay, so in the beginning it's going to look hopeless, but I promise you it gets better. <laughs> and just to be clear, this is not, so this is the skeleton of the robot. And so this is not a human animator going there and just moving or animating this video. This is really the robot, the algorithm, choosing which moves to make by moving the joints of the skeleton that you're seeing. And you can see it's already getting better. Now suddenly the robot is able to walk. So what I'm doing is I'm giving a positive reinforcement if the robot does not fall, or a negative reinforcement if I'm going away from my goal. You may ask why machine learning now? Well, I don't need to tell you about the abundance of data, correct? In 2013, we had 4.4 zettabytes, and in 2020, we have 44 zettabytes. If you are not familiar with the term zettabyte, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the term gigabyte. So if you take one trillion gigabytes, you have one zettabyte. So that means in 2020, we'll have 44 trillion gigabytes. That's a lot of data to go through, no matter where you are in the ecosystem. 
And now you know about uh, Moore's law and the growth of computing power. So we have the computing power to go through this data. So these are the technological advances that allow us to make progress in machine learning. So there are great opportunities here in the whole ecosystem of health, wealth, wellness, and healthcare, both for patients, physicians, hospitals, and companies. And I, I truly agree, and I'm, I'm really thankful for Dr. Kuster's message, but it's not only education, it's not only research, but it's also the educational component that we tend to neglect. So if we focus right now a little bit on survival analysis and the clinical care, so you as physicians, you have a deluge of information at your disposal, correct? You have family history of the individual, physical tests, cognitive tests, imaging tests, results of variums, omics, and at the end, you have to provide clinical care. So for me, it's actionable information. You need from data to uh, come up with actionable information. And this is what, I'll skip this slide, that what machine learning can provide for you. It allows you from this deluge of input to provide options for either survival analysis or for clinical care. So you can think of it as input output. So let's talk a little bit from the work that uh, you know, Dr. Magnagavi and uh, Dr. Budov are doing together on predicting the 10 year risk of an event. Okay, I'm not going to tell you about MESA. You're all familiar with MESA and the types of events we have in MESA. You're all familiar with specificity. If we look at CVD, specificity if we look at uh, coronary heart disease. And the idea is for me, the outsider, I'm just a computer scientist. The question is, can we do better? Can we improve specificity? And the answer is, well, let's try to cast a problem as predicting an event. So on the left-hand side, we'll use all the attributes that are used in existing calculators. And on the right-hand side, we'll say event or no event. Well, if we do something like that, and I'll skip all the details, you can see that you can get 100% specificity for CVD, and, 100%, and the metric classification index is about 36%. You can do the same if you add calcium score. Remember, we're not changing the, the attributes. We're just changing the recipe. The ML, the machine learning is the recipe that you use these attributes. And then again, you can get 100%. And with the net reclassification <coughs> index, 20%. Why is this important? For me, it's important because of all the discussion that we saw recently for starting therapy. And what we can see as an outcome of our work, you can see you can see the reclassification of individuals that they are not in need of statin therapy and we can talk more about it later. Actually we have a <laughs> website where you can upload the data that you have from your study and you can uh, get the numbers that our machine learning algorithm will provide to you or check individual cases and I'll be happy to give you this website later. This was the first test, correct? Very simple attributes. Can we do better? And I know some of you are looking to see what information can you get from the coronary calcifications? Can we get information that will help us uh, discriminate between ver vulnerable versus stable calcification? This is the kind of information that the machine learning algorithm will be able to help and tell you what are the features that uh, add predictive value. And actually, you can think of all these new parameters that you have from your assessments of the individual mm -hmm. and see how this will impact the survival. And again, where is education? We need to add education, I think, there. One of the challenges that one uh, becomes quickly uh, accustomed when you work in this domain is that the low number of events. And of course, low number of events is a good thing, but for computer science, that's a problem because it creates what is called unbalanced data sets. You don't have equal number of examples for positive and negative class. So in computer science speak, we had to develop computer science algorithms, will augment the data set, will augment 
uh, event so we can uh, obtain uh, we can obtain meaningful results. So if you ask me what we need, I think we need data and need large amounts of data. So for a computer scientist for like me, the idea of creating a national research focus by collecting data from different studies, it will be definitely empower uh, getting more meaningful results. And with that, I'll stop and I'll get any questions that you may have. I'd like to add here a one point that I watched Johannes and his fellows doing this machine learning. When Matt Buddha brought the first set of MESA data, the predictive value that natural reclassification sensitivity theory was significantly lower than the most recent MESA data just by adding a little bit more of MESA. Now imagine if you have all of these other cohorts added to this, the significance of uh, you know the improvement can be significantly higher. Please go ahead. Thanks for an excellent discussion. I, I'm learning. I had Google machine learning before I came here to better for myself. <coughs> that, that, I heard you correctly. You said you're enhancing specificity. I didn't hear you said the word sensitivity. And I, I think for detection, isn't that a little bit more what we're interested in? So we are enhancing both as evidenced by the metric classification index. I just focused on specificity because I wanted to make the point about people that are starting eligible versus starting non-eligible. We'll be happy to share the paper when it comes to growth. But we have less uh, power when you have a small number of cases because you have you said the specificity was very high because you have a lot of non-event that you teach Indeed. your machine Indeed. learning to learn from that many. Thank you. That's a good point. Yes, sir. So, mm -hmm. to be sure I heard you right, did you see the, the model at 100% specificity? In the, in the sense that they can so, predict non-events? So let you know? me tell you how we came up with that, okay? So the idea is we took MESA and we did leave one out. So we learned with all the, the cases except one and we were able to predict in all the cases correctly. Sorry, just punch that out again. You're able to predict, say that again, predict what? Exactly. Whether we'll have event or no event. Perfect. The specificity. So, if you start with familiar with specificity from an epidemiology point of view, would be non events, the correct prediction of non events. So, you identify perfectly the non events. That is correct. Yeah, that was my first so, so my shocking, yeah, shocking you know, question that. It's uh, you know, like perfectly non events. Okay, so, so therefore you predict perfectly the events. <clears throat> Well, no, that that he needs about 3,600 events in order to reach that kind of predictive power. Because he has a lot of non-events, he kept feeding the machine right. with this method of take one patient out, reach. Uh, it, it wasn't 100% the to begin, and it just it kept so feeding. Like to say that you can, the model like apparently can say this person will definitely not have that in within 10 in years. Time. Yeah, within the time range that we have mass events. Okay, we're limited by the information provided by the examples, correct? Mm -hmm. So the mass events are in a 10 year period. So what we are saying, whether you have an event or not in the 10 year period, that's not one year. Really? It's, uh, as I understand it, it's the machine that is learning something. I'm not learning anything. <laughs> 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 it's a problem. Because if I don't understand the disease, if I don't understand the output in some way, how can I treat it? Well, I can treat increased risk uh, not specifically, but I cannot treat the cause of the increased risk. I don't know what's going on. I think, uh, the machine is learning, I'm not, not learning anything because I don't know how you get to the result. So that's an excellent point, Erling. So if you look at this here, using what machine has learned, will be able to find out what are the important attributes mm -hmm. from all this deluge of data that will help us understand the biology of the disease. How can it help us understand biology if we don't know what's going on? So, it, of course, it's limited by... I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to invent new biology. But I'm, my answer is, from all this input, we'll be able to tell you 
which factors are most important than others. A rank ordering of the factors, okay? The machine cannot go beyond the factors that you have in your input. What can tell you is what is the relevant importance of the factors. So um, we're not discovering the mechanism. We're discovering no. the importance of features. Because you also say you can use it to find the therapeutic, new therapeutic target, and you want to find that you need, you need to know what is mediating or causing the uh, increased risk. So I will, I will argue that you can think of it as understanding what are the features that can be the source of new hypothesis testing. Okay. I will argue that. Again, as an outsider, must be your scientist. But if you find the relative importance of different attributes, that will allow you for new hypothesis testing using all the scientific methodologies that we are familiar with. Do you know what's going on in the machine? Do you know that? Uh, yes, actually, you can convert the trained model. You convert it to a number of rules, and in our case, it's about 200 rules. So yes, you can convert it as a set of rules. But why does IBM call it automated intelligence? Because it's a task that requires you to digest 200 rules, and you don't want to go through 200 rules if you want to come up with this. But when the machine is learning, it is changing the rules the whole time, isn't it? No, you're learning based on the set of data. And if you add additional data, the rules are changing. Yes. Yeah. It's changing function. Well, depends on the on your update, correct? Right now we have fixed it for Mesa, but maybe we want to apply the same training model to Framingham Heart Study. We're not changing the rules. We say how these rules are performing in a new study. But learning constantly actually is not a bad thing. You want to learn constantly because you want to build anti-fragility. You want to build muscle by learning constantly. You are improving the rules. Yes, but who is? I just say, what do I do? The machine is learning. What do I do? That's up to you. Honest, I have a question. Yes, on the augmented data set, what is that? How does that? How do you get those? So basically, we developed a, a computer science method that allows you to create additional events by taking. We, we are creating imaginary patients that have events, and we can use them to offer training examples. These are com completely synthetic examples, but this technology improved uh, the NRI that we have there. So this is an iterative process with the same data set. What extent are you just overfitting to your own model in terms of generalizability outside that? So that's a very valid question, and these uh, results should be taken with a grain of salt, because this is just 6,000 individuals, correct? So if you ask me, I would like to see the results when we will have 20 million individuals. I'm not here to tell you that we invented the next thing after the slash spread. I'm here to tell you that if we have more data, I think we'll be able to, to see if these ideas hold any water or not. Actually, that website that Johannes showed created for us as we go move forward in our project. No, our project focuses on one year event and a lot of other data to come in, but meanwhile, we can use the tool that he developed, <coughs> upload, I was talking to Samir, and we talked about Fusser, they have quite a few of these larger studies. They can feed and see how it performs in their data set, in your data set. And, and so we evaluate, both evaluate also feed. You saw the robot that was falling. He didn't show all the movie. The beginning was awful. This robot was just falling left and right. But by the time it reached 600 reiteration, which is a lot of computer work, it was almost running. So hopefully his machine learning will run as we these new data. So I can bring up more data from my companies into that program? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so obviously it has to be adjudicated. Yeah. So thinking yeah. about you know, the future application getting to the patient or the physician with this 
ability to predict events. This is based on a huge amount of data, which is not going to be available clinically, even if it may outperform the uh, pooled cohorts equation. So how do you go from however many bits of data that you have, this large amounts of data, to how do you boil it down to a clinically <coughs> okay, so this is based on Framingham risk factor only. 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 I thought, I'm sorry. I thought it was based on the Mesa data. No, no, no. So let me repeat that point because I think it's very important. We're not proposing any new attributes or new risk factors, correct? Saying, take your favorite calculator use exactly the same attributes, the same factors, and we're just taking, changing the cooking recipe. I'm sorry, you're changing the what? The cooking recipe. Oh. It's like, so you know, that you're making a, a, a plate, correct? You give me the same ingredients, but I change the cooking recipe, and I get a different plate. Also, let me tell you another thing, and allow me to get into jargon. It's called learning using privileged information. When I'm learning, I can use a thousand attributes, but when I see a, a patient in front of me, I know only 10. There is way in computer science where you can take advantage of all the vast information that you have for learning, but when the patient is presenting to you, you can use only a subset. That's some of the latest advances in computer science that we can take advantage. But here is just established risk factors. And you can put us to the test. You can uh, submit a test where you know the uh, data set where you know the answer, and we'll do the prediction, and you can do the validation on your own. Uh, I would like to uh, move a little fast forward and invite our online participants to additional computer scientists. So we're starting with computer scientists back to back because they are really bringing outsider uh, intelligence to this. So Professor Kumar and his younger faculty, Dr. Arjunan, are participating in our uh, meeting from Australia, Melbourne, Australia. If Dr. Kumar and Arjunan are available, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, I don't know what time is it. <laughs> I, uh, I'll share it is just after one o'clock. Sorry, we lost you. I said out here, the time is just after 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Okay. Well, we're approaching uh, 9 p.m. here in New Orleans. Please go ahead. The next few uh, 10, 15 minutes are yours. And uh, when Thank you, you ask questions, please go ahead. Okay, now the background is we have uh, studied uh, the Australian Blue Mountain Study Database, uh, which we were conducting analysis for the retina. And uh, in that, we tried to understand the risk factors for uh, using uh, the Framingham equation in the beginning and other methods, and we found that they did not work very well. So then we kind of, we attempted to come up with our own uh, method, which is what we are reporting here. And uh, before I uh, even start, the purpose we are hoping is that we can get our hands onto more databases, including the Framingham uh, uh, database, if we can, to see whether we can do something better than uh, what it was before. So, and. We know that uh, CVD is uh, one of the single largest causes of uh, mortality worldwide. We also know that it's uh, a big cost to the health system everywhere in the world. And uh, in, uh, in order to, to prevent and make uh, uh, reduce the chances of CVD, uh, at least in Australia and uh, most parts of the world, it, uh, pay, uh, people when they uh, turn the magic number, typical 45, and, and 
they uh, get a risk score, which is uh, based upon the Framingham modified uh, Framingham uh, uh, model, uh, and which uses certain parameters uh, about our health. And there are other factors as well. However, uh, it is um, uh, so far the literature seems to suggest that Framingham risk score is the superior single risk factor. And there are arguments whether Framingham has got the right uh, parameters, etc. We are, are in this particular context not uh, discussing and arguing of that fact. Uh, what we are uh, concerned is that uh, whether we can, whether we were able to predict people's health uh, issues before it happened uh, using the longitudinal study which was conducted in VMES Blue Mountains I uh, study. So well, what we then uh, attempted is, uh, well, there were arguments in literature that the difference is perhaps related to the difference in the demographics, or uh, uh, it is because uh, the ethnic uh, population in Framingham at the time of the analysis was different than perhaps in Australia. So uh, we wanted to test whether that is the major uh, driving force, the factor, or whether it is actually that the model in itself has got too many approximations, having a model being a linear model, maybe we needed a nonlinear model. So with that aim, we uh, performed the analysis uh, for the population-based study, and uh, we found that uh, using Framingham model, our outcomes were very, very poor, um, and uh, because we we this database has got 15-year-old longitudinal data with the people being monitored every five years. So we know what the health parameters were uh, at the end of the study, and we were trying to uh, look back and see whether we could predict them. But we were unable to do that. Uh, so we had, while we had collected more uh, data than what was uh, used in this particular study, but that was simply because we wanted to compare our technique with the Framingham model in itself, and thus we only wanted to, we restricted ourselves only to those parameters. Now, Blue Mountains uh, I study is uh, a population-based study, which uh, Blue Mountains is a suburb of uh, Sydney, and uh, the, in this particular study, the people were 49 years and, and older, and uh, the, uh, the entire suburb, the 99% plus, was uh, uh, taken and uh, this is largely a European descent uh, uh, study, European including uh, the Anglo-Saxon in this case. Uh, the total number of people in the study were 3,654, uh, and uh, we've, uh, we in this particular study we followed we followed people every five years for 15 years or till mortality. <coughs> so in, in this particular so the, uh, the after we've done uh, the analysis of the study, uh, we broke it down into the number of people who uh, we could uh, follow up for the, the ten-year follow-up uh, study, and uh, people who had CVD after that period, and people who did not have CVD. So as you can see, the uh, the numbers are in uh, there: smokers, cholesterol level, etc., were all captured in this particular slide in the database. Once that was done, and we did the Framingham risk equation, um, which is in the slide in front of us, it was that uh, uh, the results, uh, the, I think the next slide covers the results, which we got, and the 95% confidence ratio. So what we then can determine is that could we use a non-linear method and support where vector machine is one such good example. Uh, could do that, and uh, we uh, again attempted to do the same thing. We used a simple uh, SVM using linear kernel and uh, with C values, which were default basically in, from the system. And uh, we again attempted uh, to do this with a different kernel, but as you'll see, that the, uh, that these particular differences were small. Uh, once we had done that, we then. Get, uh, got uh, obtained from the SVM model the weights, the weights corresponding to 
how much is the relationship of each of these with the uh, or the strength of the connection but, uh, between the, uh, the parameter and the net target output. Now, uh, once we, we did that, uh, we've got them listed uh, there. And uh, age obviously was the biggest uh, single uh, parameter, which is pretty similar to what the Birmingham equation also gives us. Uh, once we had done that, we did a comparative, uh, and uh, we also then did the sensitivity and specificity analysis. Uh, we got the AUC. Now, uh, using the SVM, we got the uh, AUC of 0 0.71. And using logistic uh, regression analysis, it was 0.63. And the Framingham risk model gave 0.57. Now, the logistic regression analysis, uh, not being super high, suggests that just by changing the ethnicity of the people or, uh, or the demographics of the people was not such a strong parameter. It, it did contribute from point, well, 0 0.57 to 0 0.63. However, it was not enough. But when you change the model from the linear model to a non-linear model like an SVM, it uh, then changed significantly. So 0 0.71 uh, while compared with 0 0.57. Now, at this particular stage, uh, uh, the, uh, we used only the uh, parameters which were of the family model. Well, now, of course, we do understand the many other parameters which we should consider. For example, family history, or for example, uh, the girth size uh, of the person, or uh, not only just uh, smoking history alcohol and uh, the history as well, or the exercise. However, we haven't captured that in this particular study because uh, this study was very uh, the fact that, uh, parameters only. Well, uh, that uh, was a quick uh, thing of uh, and uh, Dr. Kumar, is that you? That's me. So thank you. This, again, I think you reiterated what Dr. Kakadiaris just said, that you're taking the same ingredient, and you're just running through a different recipe, and that's the nonlinear SVM approach. And so you, is that right? Sorry, we're losing you. When we use SVM, please note this is only an example. It could be with any other uh, similar similar uh, machine learning uh, method, and the results should be reasonably similar. Okay. So I guess the conclusion here is that this is another example of how machine learning uh, can do better than our traditional, pretty much everything that we use in a statistical method is a linear method. Uh, uh, and so other variables that he's, you know, pay attention to possibly with family history and um, uh, waste circumference and things like that, obviously, are still preliminary compared to what we're trying to uh, obtain with, you know, genomic, proteomic, metabolomic, and all that. Any questions for Dr. Kumar? <coughs> okay, great. I think we've already... Uh, beaten the, the machine learning horse uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit. And uh, with, so I think these two presentation just took the raw numerical data. The next presentation is taking us to a different class of data, and that's imaging. As a matter of fact, that's where the uh, sort of burden of industry attention uh, has been IBM with various companies to do that. So, with uh, again, thanks uh, to our colleagues from Australia. We're going to Los Angeles, and we have Dr. Piotr Slomka from Cedar Sinai Medical Center, uh, who's a again a computer scientist. Uh, he's been in cardiology for. A, quite a while and, and knows our lingo as well as his lingo. So, Piotr, are you on the line? 
needs to switch to. Can you turn on your microphone? We can't hear you. Piotr, can you, can you hear me? We cannot hear you. Your microphone is not on. So we're going to wait a few minutes. And if you can't get your microphone on. Uh, and if you are not going to speak, then we have Dan Berman here to speak on behalf of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, Dan, for coming. So we have your uh, brilliant scientists online trying to find a way to connect through microphone. Piotr, can, can you hear us? You know, this is a problem with Los Angeles, actually, I know. Uh, because uh, okay. once in India, me. we me. had uh, me. all come like, uh, it was the 60th year me. of Cardiology Society of India, and we had 30 people mm -hmm. from United Those States. All attendees, he's on the staff. Dr. Gromwald could not make it, so he said that he could speak from Los Angeles. And uh, we had absolutely everything very well connected. You know, like I mean, we were talking to them, everything is all fixed. Whole whole hall is full, absolutely standing. 3,500 people waiting for him to speak. He comes on, you can see his picture, but we cannot hear. <laughs> now, we are like struggling. We just couldn't manage to do anything. Can you hear, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. I was on the phone. So I had to just call back again. It was everything was connected, but never mind. Uh, so now it's everything is okay, right? Yeah, yes. Give me, give me one okay. Just, just a second. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I had to put the on my phone and phone on the night cell phone, and he spoke. Later on, we realized that the satellite was transmitting yeah. Hawaii, and they had put it. On. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Thank you all uh, for getting through your challenge, Piotr. I think we have now okay. everybody hearing you. Okay. All right. So let me just start. So uh, I will be presenting uh, machine learning, and you can see my screen now. Uh, second screen, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. So basically, the previous speakers covered very well. The machine learning parts. I will not get into the technicalities, but I like to present a little bit about the work we've been doing in imaging uh, with cardiology, with Dr. Berman and uh, and uh, Dr. Min and others, in in sort of looking at you know how we can use it in sort of like you know kind of going a little bit lower down uh, from the high level now to the low level of how we can actually use it and in some small incremental way way improve it. So. Without getting too much into detail, one thing was mentioned before is you know that we you know how we do this and we build these models and we don't have to assume particular models. We use this in statistics quite a bit, and I'll show you one example with logistic regression. But here we don't have to actually be, assume any models. But the, what is important, and there was a uh, talk before, there was one comment about overfitting. What's important that the testing data is always separate from the training data when we do this, because otherwise we would end up fitting a perfect model which predicts everything from the data the computer already, or already has seen. So the important thing is to uh, test it always on data which computer has not seen before. So I will just very briefly, I won't get into details, but I'll probably like spend a couple of minutes on each of these topics. First, I'll tell you uh, about how we improve actually image segmentation contouring with machine learning. And then something very simple using logistic regression, how we can add two scans together to predict better coronary artery disease. And then uh, then we move, move to uh, uh, a, a, a paper we published uh, recently about you know how we could predict revascularization possibly, uh, and then something sort of like, sort of pilot study, but we showed that actually from CTA from multiple features from one modality you could predict results in the other modality maybe then uh, you don't have to do that more expensive scan, uh, and then more along the lines of what you've seen before presented uh, would be a couple of studies here one where we show. Uh, using imaging CTA and clinical data combined uh, to predict uh, uh, death, um, mortality, and sort of a preliminary study we just show uh, recently at ASNIC where we predict maze from fast MPS, uh, sort of interesting results. So 
I'm going to move on. So I will, this, this, I don't have to explain anymore. I think this has been covered very well, but I just want to tell you there was a very nice uh, um, uh, editorial in circulation, sort of cardiologist friendly on machine learning. Uh, uh, and, and there was a very nice figure there showing, you know, what, what we're doing here. I think everyone understands we have many patients and the patients have many features and there are some outcomes, for example, MI. Uh, myocardial infarction and the simplest thing you can think of machine learning would be you know try find you know what kind of cluster of features uh, has you know particular patients who for example don't have an MI and then you try to find those kind of clusters or those kind of combinations of features and you'll say well those people who have those kind of features will not have MI uh, in this case so this is kind of a very basic algorithm which actually there is an algorithm called K nearest neighbor which works just like that but there are much more sophisticated algorithms as, as you have heard so something uh, recently published just came out a few weeks ago uh, to show you something sort of not not trying to replace the cardiologist but more on the technology side because in, in nuclear cardiology we have this big problem we have this uh, cardiac uh, scan and w when we uh, when we uh, fit the, the data we sometimes don't know where to put the valve plane it's kind of very tricky and if you put the valve plane wrong you get wrong results on your polar map and everything then of course will be wrong so so technologists are you know always putting this valve plane in the correct position and we always have this problem that we always have to quality control this data and takes a lot of time and it's also variable so we were thinking can we somehow employ machine learning uh, to actually position the valve plane exactly where where we would like that valve plane to be so we don't have to do this manual task all the time so that's what we have done in this in this study recently uh, published where we will look at different image features so in this case it wouldn't be some patient features like uh, you know clinical features but it would be something what the computer sees on the image for example you know uh, how this peak looks like when you move this valve plane or you know what the polar map looks like or what's the shape of the heart is it too long or too short short so when we apply this kind of techniques we showed something very interesting and that is when we to take two very experienced technologies who do that you know 20 years or so the difference is uh, when this technology is pushed this valve plane is about you know eight millimeter or so and that actually has some re effect on on uh, on clinical outcomes but when we actually um uh when we actually uh compare it to the machine learning here svm that's the same technique which the previous speaker was was presenting uh when this computer will look at different image features and then we'll just put the valve plane where it thinks it should be learn from those technologies before on, on some different data set uh, and we find that these differences are actually smaller than between two experts and and then we also show that it actually diagnostically is no difference so we actually with this kind of technique you could pretty much automate positioning this vast plane in the nuclear scan so pretty much automating this whole process of getting extracting all the image image features from the images uh, so that's kind of like a, a simple example on on where we could apply it on to, to detect uh, to to improve image analysis in our in our uh, data so moving on to like a more higher level uh, example where we would um, in this case we would uh, want to know as you know and calcium scan you you've mentioned calcium scan before and and we know that for example on PET CT scan we often have calcium scan together with with uh, PET scan uh, and the question is can we somehow combine this data right now we don't right now we are do doing it in somehow in some mental capacity of the physician you will say okay well there's a uh, there is a you know a calcium score and there's this kind of scan what what happens so can we actually use machine learning and and just use for example two two variables very simple task which we don't even do today as it is in the clinic and can we have like a better way of predicting in this case coronary disease obstructive disease so we actually in this case we because it's such a simple exam uh, example we actually used just uh, logistic regression but we use it in a way we would use machine learning we would we would try to predict uh, in from you know using this kind of a separate populations uh, and we will come up with and you probably are very familiar with this kind of uh, technique because this is used very a lot in in uh, in uh, medicine but uh, but it is also used in machine learning it's like a very basic technique and with this technique the nice thing is that you have this kind of equation you can come up and then this equation will tell you okay even per vessel you know you can have a per vessel calcium score and per vessel tpd tpd is something we we compute here on the on this uh, on this images automatically 
and we say, okay, there's a 3% TPD, which is borderline, and, and then we'll have a, you know, a, a very, you know, very little, maybe just calcium score of one or zero, in this case it was one, and then from this two, we will compute, a, uh, compute a, actually a score of obstructive disease uh, probability. So when we do this, we can actually combine it and look at the ROC curves. And then you see here that, you know, doing this, you actually improve. This was your PET alone. This is your calcium score. And this will be the combined. And this is, in, this is done in separate populations using the Stanford uh, cross-validation. And, and so this is statistically significantly better. So without doing additional scan, we can actually predict uh, the, uh, the obstructive disease better. And this will be done in... Uh, for any patient, so it's not just for particular score, but you could just plug in the score into this equation. So that's one simple way. But now we were thinking, okay, can we actually apply, uh, you know, use more features and predict, for example, something like revascularization uh, by machine learning? So now we're getting into this higher level techniques like have been described before. And so, so here is an example from the published study where we will use the image information like this TPD which we automatically derive from the images and then some other information like for example ST uh, segment depression or, or uh, you will use ECG uh, response and we will use uh, some other scores which are already available uh, and, and so forth and the computer will find rankings of what is actually useful for m machine learning uh, and then and this is called feature selection and then based on that we will we will then uh, uh, apply this combine like the, all these features combine and try to predict uh, revascularization and here we use technique call, called boosting or ensemble learning and without getting too much into details the very simple way intuitive way to understand this is that it's like trying to have three different of or multiple different uh, learners or like three different observers, three different cardiologists, for example. And when you, each of them will have a slightly different answer. Maybe each of them is quite good, but they have their strengths and, and weaknesses. So, but when you combine them, the, this kind of techniques usually result in better, uh, in better results. So that's what we use. Called, this is called ensemble uh, boosting learning, logic boost. And when we apply this here, and this is kind of a predicting of revascularization by machine learning, and here we have actual experts. So those experts are, this is the, 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 the uh, some different score of two different experts. And you see how this def the different expert in blue, how they're different in predicting this. Uh, this the green one would be just the computer uh, image variables. But when you actually add the clinical variables, it becomes much more, uh, much more uh, predictive. And, and so this is all statistically significant. And you see that there is no really difference in, in using machine learning for this kind of task versus, you know, this experts who, who, and actually in this experts was actually, uh, this expert too was actually much, much worse than, uh, than, uh, than before. So now something uh, just sort of, this is a pilot study where we try to see if, if it's possible, for example, again, keep, keeping separate data testing from training, uh, is it possible to, uh, to show, uh, to, to from, CT analysis, and we this is work we're doing here at CDA Sinai. We we do this uh, advanced plaque analysis on CTA, and this kind of analysis, uh, as you see, as you see here at the bottom, it can it can uh, show you. Uh, actually, see if I use a, a, a pointer. Yeah. So here you you, you the, 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 the you can imagine there could be multiple image features from from derived from this, and and we derive uh, five features such as. Uh, remodeling index and stenosis and plaque volume and so forth. But we also add things like myocardial mass and age and gender. And then if we use that, we can actually predict uh, myocardial flow results by PET very accurately. So this is a small study, but it shows you the per vessel or per patient, you can actually predict flow uh, measurement by PET from those kind of features, including some other additional information about the patient. Uh, this is a recent study, uh, so it shows you how you could use machine learning to sort of maybe, uh, you know, uh, economize on some tests that you could use one test and sort of efficiently use the information as much as possible from one test to predict some other results. And in, a, in another study with CTA, we were working with a sort of a larger database where we had uh, 16,000 cases from 12 centers. This is with uh, Dr. Min uh, Confirm Registry. Recently, we published a paper on how we can predict death uh, in, this, in this kind of study using imaging and uh, clinical uh, features together. So similar like with this um, revascularization uh, study, we, the computer will 
find features which are important. And here there's many more features, and at some point these features become not very important. But you see here is a mix of, of things which are uh, clinical, and then also uh, and then also uh, some image features like uh, like uh, for example stenosis and so forth. These image features in this case were manually derived from the confirm. This was an automatic processing of CTA at this point, but you can imagine that it could be. And with this kind of technique, we use this. Uh, you know, with the 16, uh, this was actually uh, around 10,000 patients from from which this was run on suspected uh, patients with suspected coronary disease. We use this kind of uh, tenfold validation, and importantly. Uh, when we do it, we use this tenfold validation where we will use 90% uh, of the data for training and then 10% of the testing. But then we will keep that away and store this result. And then we use another 90% for training and, and test it on another 10%. So that way we use 10 different models, but every time the data is separate, training data is separate from the test data. And with this kind of result, and you've heard before was the Framingham risk score, you see here in, in, in blue, and here is the machine learning in the 10,000 patients. This is five-year uh, all-cause mortality prediction. So, uh, so you see that that it's pretty accurate. And actually, uh, probably uh, if this was a shorter uh, period, it would be more accurate. But uh, but there would be not enough events. So we we are just as previous speaker were, were talking about it. The data is very important. How many events you have is not how many all patients you have here, but how many events you have. But there was about 900 events here, so this is a pretty substantial population. And you can see that these techniques can be very, very accurate uh, and, and perhaps useful. And so you can look at it also with this uh, net reclassification index, uh, and you can see here that, you know, using this ML uh, machine learning boosting compared to Framingham risk score, uh, the, the patients can be up risks in, in red or de-risked in blue. And you can see the total net reclassification index was 24% uh, when you apply this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, if you use this as a new score uh, for your, for your uh, uh, prognostic uh, prediction. So, so those kind of techniques could be used in a sort of a recent study which, where, which we have shown at, um, at um, ASNIC here. We show that... Uh, it actually is very interesting that this is only 2,600 single center studies, so, so we're working on more, many more cases. This is using uh, fast uh, M MPS, uh, microperfusion imaging, and we can build the model and, and predict it. And what's interesting is that we can then look at the percentile score because this machine learning score will be this kind of a, you know, continuous score, which will give you probability, and this will be the actual events. This is a maze, three-year maze prediction. And you can see how well it's fitted. So like even here, what was surprising to us, that even at 50%, you know, like this is a pretty high chance of having MACE event within, within three years, 50%. You know, this is, this is the gray ones are the actual rates and the red ones would be the predicted rates. So that shows you a pretty, you know, accurate prediction to, to actually what kind of probability we are talking about. So it's like whole range and especially here also, it's very good. And you see the ROC again, you see this, you know, big jump in, in accuracy when you use this kind of techniques. So we are actually trying to combine, get more data, get like 10, 10 sites and get like a more meaningful uh, data sets where we can apply this, uh, we can apply this kind of techniques and, and have this, develop this course and, and have people uh, use this kind of scores, which, uh, which could be potentially could be used in clinically. Uh, and the one question, the last slide I'd like to show is that there was a question about, you know, this is a black box and how do we know that what machine is doing? So actually, uh, in a sort of a one study, we showed that it is possible uh, to show what, how the computer arrives at the particular risk score. And it, there are some techniques which will tell you in a, in a given patient, for a given patient, what particular uh, features were responsible for the high score. And will tell you this, give you this kind of something called rational value. So for this particular case, uh, it was a very high risk uh, score and it says okay well that was the some some stress score and age and and some rest score and el enlargement of uh, left ventricle lung uptake and in, in this was an, another study where they were using digoxin uh, so so those kind of features were in this in this particular model were showing that those features were responsible for uh, for the high score so that would just sort of open up this black box a little bit for the cardiologist to show you know what what this could be used for. So in summary, what I like to say is that we, we know that machine learning combines these multiple 
features. And we can actually combine imaging and clinical data points into one score. We can just put it all together. And we can also use it to train image segmentation. That will make our uh, images more, more accurate to start with, the, the data which we feed into machine learning. And then we can predict disease, intervention, outcomes uh, in terms of post-test probability. We give this kind of post-test probability for a particular outcome. Uh, and I don't think we should worry about the cardiologist sort of worry about replacing it. I think it will be a great tool, a, a tool which will find the better answer for the patients. I think no one would, every cardiologist would like to have a tool like that which will give them better answers for the patients. So, so that, that's everything. Thank you very much uh, for, for inviting me and Thank sorry you. I couldn't be in person there. Thank you very much, Piotr. This was very nice. I think you wrapped it up very well. You answered also Dr. Falk's fear that it's all machine. What does he learn? So I think the machine can give you some ways in the score. Any particular question mm -hmm. before we move on? Dr. Narula? Uh, uh, more, more than a question, it is a, a comment. I think it was fabulous talk. Absolutely fabulous talk. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Just put everything together. It is, it is amazing. And uh, Dan, uh, congratulations to you and your team for what you are doing. And Thank you. It becomes much more relevant today. Uh, how many of us did uh, did we see the future trial presented this afternoon mm -hmm. uh, on the FFR in the multivascular disease? Totally tanked. 2.4 times higher mm -hmm. risk of having uh, mace when you are doing it with FFR. So I think the imaging is going to come back. Mm -hmm. The reason being that uh, if uh, we do what we have been doing together, that the FFR probably is not only predicted by the QCA, it is predicted by the lipid volume also. And uh, the lesions that we are uh, fixing, specifically when there is a multi disease and multi lesion per artery, we are screwing up by fixing the wrong lesion, while the FFR may be ca uh, caused by something else. So I think this, mm. this trial today was such an eye-opener that after doing 900 kids, they stopped it, and uh, FFR has gone out of the window. So I think this is this is amazing what you did. Fantastic. Well, non-invasive non imaging. Uh, really has a lot to benefit from machine learning. This has a lot more information than, you know, six variables that you have in Framingham. And so, uh, thanks again, Piotr. We're gonna move on to the next presentation, yeah. where basically as, so I sort of went back and forth. I started by describing the project. Uh, Dr. Fuster, uh, through the challenge, what is really the challenge once you know the risk. Now, I think we're coming back to define actually the challenges of knowing the risk. So it's a double challenge uh, tonight. And our speaker here is Dr. Uh, Armin Zadeh from uh, Johns Hopkins. And he is uh, online to share with us challenges and opportunities in predicting acute coronary events. Dr. Zare, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Good evening from Baltimore. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Please, go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this exciting event. Uh, we'll uh, talk about our specific contribution to this project a little later. But as kind of an introduction, I will spend the next few minutes to discuss some of the challenges, but also opportunities in predicting acute coronary events. Can so you, this is a kind of scenario. Uh, I'm sorry. Can, you, can you expand yes. your slides to a slideshow? We are only seeing a small thumbnail. Well, I think if you go to display settings, you should have the option. Go to slideshow. Actually, down there, press on that, or a slideshow, or F5. Actually, okay. if you go to the slideshow tab at the top, next to animations and review, yes. And well, it is at a slideshow right now. 
Or maybe the issue is that the screen is not it's not the the right after it's changed the oh, screen. By the way, top it says 42 percent. Can you make it like 100 percent? No, well, no. The issue is that the I have to change the screen. I'm operating two screens. So, or is there a way to let me see? Yes, this is probably it. All right. Okay, perfect. How's that? Okay, good. Okay. Sorry about that. Give me just one second here. All right. So this is the kind of scenario we are, you know, trying to prevent here. Uh, shown is a histology slide of a uh, in the, of the proximal AD of an unfortunate 37-year-old man who. Uh, died suddenly. We can appreciate that the vessel lumen is filled here with uh, thrombus overlaying a large plaque which is a necrotic core. The thrombus actually was triggered by a plaque erosion, not rupture, as the fibrous cap is still intact, as you can see here. And from imaging and pathology studies, we know that plaque erosions and plaque ruptures account for most of the culprit lesions in patients suffering acute coronary events. And this knowledge led to the assumption that detecting plaques prone to plaque disruption would allow identifying individuals at uh, high risk of suffering acute coronary events. This assumption, however, is challenged by the fact that plaque ruptures frequently occur without causing any clinical syndromes. In this table, we went through the exercise summarizing the prevalence of plaque ruptures not associated with acute coronary syndromes in different populations, including normal controls, patients with stable coronary heart disease, and those with acute coronary syndromes triggered by other culprit lesions. Plaque ruptures are typically difficult to detect, particularly by imaging techniques, but even pathology studies do not identify all plaque ruptures, and as such, these numbers most certainly underestimate the true prevalences of ruptured plaques. Now, the, two, the first two rows here, they show data from pathology series, which probably are closest to the true prevalence, revealing that 30, 17 to 31 percent of normal controls that are patients who died of non-cardiac causes had ruptured plaques in the coronary tree, which were not associated with coronary thrombosis or symptoms prior to their death. And below are data derived by IVIS in patients with stable coronary heart disease, and you can see that these numbers are somewhat lower, as IVIS is not the ideal tool to detect plaque ruptures. Using OCT, on the other hand, which is more sensitive, we see prevalences closer to those by pathologies. Pathology, particularly considering that these techniques are far from perfect detecting plaque ruptures, the results indicate that plaque ruptures are present in a substantial number of patients without evidence of acute coronary events. In patients who do have ACS, and these are the last uh, two columns here, uh, triggered by other lesions, we find that non corporate plaque ruptures even, uh, are more frequently present as an expression of a panvascular as opposed to a local process. You see here uh, about 50% show non corporate plaque ruptures in the patients with acute coronary syndrome. And we also know from pathology studies that the vast majority of stenotic plaques reveal evidence of prior ruptures as shown in this example, the collagen tissue stained here in green is filling the gap of a large, large uh, rupture in this advanced plaque. And uh, one of the, once the tissue has filled the gap, it is exceedingly difficult to recognize that a prior rupture occurred, hence the underestimation of prior ruptures, even by histopathology. Pathologists therefore believe that most, if not all, advanced plaques have underwent prior ruptures. And if we are lucky, we catch the sequence of events in, in one frame, such as demonstrated here. This plaque contains evidence of the prior, uh, three prior ruptures, actually, here, there, and there, uh, which, which, is, which is associated uh, with the healing process and, and the expansion of volume. These data from uh, several pathology groups actually demonstrating that repeated plaque ruptures are an important mechanism for plaque growth, explaining the often rapid development of stenosis over a short period of time. So given the evidence of prior plaque ruptures in most lesions with a stenosis of 50% or greater, and given the evidence 
that at least 5 to 10 percent of the asymptomatic population have coronary stenosis of such degree even among relatively young individuals dying of non-cardiac causes as shown here in the autopsy series from Mayo Clinic. Uh, we must conclude that plaque ruptures indeed occur quite frequently and in most cases do not lead to clinical syndromes. The great British pathologist Michael J. Davis knew this uh, all along. He's quoted to have said this in the 1990s already that the vast majority of plaque ruptures occur without clinical symptoms. Uh, and therefore, detecting plaques prone to rupture does not necessarily identify patients at high risk because most of these will rupture silently. It's therefore also not surprising that many of the efforts to identify high-risk patients by the means of vulnerable plaque imaging have been disappointing. The million-dollar question really is, and Michael Davis was among the first posing this question, what does go wrong in these exceptional cases in which a plaque rupture does cause an acute coronary event? And the short answer is we, we don't know what ultimately has to go wrong for allowing vascular thrombosis to occur in response to plaque erosion or rupture. For the regular scenario, that is an asymptomatic plaque rupture, we assume that the thrombosis containing uh, factors are aligned to prevent more than a local intramural thrombus. So in this more common scenario, the plaque ruptures, but the artery remains patent and the plaque heals and grows. In the more unlikely scenario of an acute coronary syndrome, thrombosis promoting factors at the time of rupture seem to tilt the scale in their favor and allowing partial or complete vascular thrombosis to occur. And again, we don't know which factors are particularly relevant in this scenario, but it appears that there are, these are highly complex events and involving numerous factors. Ultimately, the risk of an acute coronary event is the result of the interplay between the stimulus for thrombus in the coronary tree and the vulnerability of the system for clinically relevant vascular thrombosis. Some, but surely not all, factors are outlined here in the schematic, including many of our you know, typical risk factors for coronary events and many of them related to inflammation. And as Chairman Dr. Nagavi and the SHAPE Committee astutely summarized in their 2003 position paper, it is about the vulnerable patient and not just about plaques. And we as cardiologists are particularly guilty neglecting the clinical importance of the vulnerable blood in the process. Indeed, it is the response to the plaque alteration which determines the outcome. And unfortunately, this response may vary substantially depending on the particular conditions at the time of plaque rupture. So the challenge to predict the response of the blood to the stimulus of thrombosis in the coronary tree at the time of rupture or erosion is illustrated here by evidence of the large performance variability of the coagulation system, which really is in constant flux, you know, varying almost minute to minute, and shown are the activities of several hemostatic factors over several hours on the left and on, over the year on the right, demonstrating substantial diurnal and seasonal variability for fibrinogen, D-dimer, TPA, von Willebrand's factors. This is just an example of some of these. And uh, so not accidentally, acute MIs occur more frequently at certain times during the day, particularly in the morning hours, where catecholamin levels tend to be higher uh, with a more thrombosis-favoring milieu, and the autonomic nervous system likewise underlies a strong circadian rhythm and the complex interplay of vascular tone, blood flow, hemostatic factors likely determine uh, the final outcome. So given the numbers of factors involved, the complexity of mechanisms and their temporal variability, we are likely looking at a perfect storm scenario for acute uh, coronary events to occur, which explains our difficulty in acutely and accurately predicting these events. The good news is that we do know some of the key factors affecting risk. Uh, foremost, we must have atherosclerotic disease to be at risk. If we don't have coronary atherosclerotic disease, our risk of sustaining an acute coronary event is exceedingly low. Conversely, the greater the uh, disease burden, the greater the risk. And remarkably, there is there's really a near linear relationship between the coronary calcium score as a crude marker or estimate of the atherosclerotic uh, disease burden and mortality. And this relationship is intuitive. The more atherosclerotic disease, the greater the number of plaque erosions and ruptures occur in the coronary tree, and thus the greater the probability that uh, plaque alterations, alteration happens at a vulnerable time of the coagulation system. 
However, this concept works reasonably well on a population basis, but it still does not allow high accuracy of predicting short-term events in an individual. And in, in order to increase our ability to identify patients at risk, we need, we need indeed to integrate a large number of individual factors which may indicate an unfavorable response to the stimulus of thrombosis. And I see that machine learning may indeed help identifying which factors and which combination infers the greatest risk. This position clearly plays a major role in this context and there's great interest in the disentangling genetic patterns associated with increased or decreased probability of allowing vascular thrombosis in, in response to plaque disruption. So I'd like to close with a proposal from our side for the use of clinical data in support of the machine learning project. We coordinated two international motor center studies on the accuracy of CT cornea angiography for the diagnosis of coronary artery disease compared to cardiac catheterization. And we are collecting long-term follow-up uh, in these participants for comparing patient outcome according to imaging findings. These studies are the CORE64 and CORE320 studies. And the specific value of these data sets lie lies in the fact that these were fairly high-risk patients as, as opposed to some of our the primary uh, prevention uh, populations such as MESA, et cetera. I mean, these are symptomatic patients, higher-risk patients with uh, event rates, heart event rates of about 2% per year. So despite the rather small patient populations, we expect to see a good number of events because of the length of follow-up and the risk characteristics of the populations. And we are particularly excited to be able to compare risk assessment using different tools, such as coronary calcium scanning, stenosis assessment, stenosis location, plaque, uh, plaque characterization, perfusion assessment. So we have a real array of, of, uh, of possibilities here to, to compare. Uh, which, which should help identifying the most appropriate ways to risk stratify patients as we ultimately need to practically apply the, our methods in, 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 in patients. So in, in conclusions, uh, the mechanisms leading to acute coronary symptoms are highly complex and underlie substantial temporary variability which really hinders accurate prediction. But at the same time, integration of coronary artery disease characteristics and risk factors for vascular thrombosis into comprehensive models may identify individuals at increased risk and uh, clinical studies are needed to isolate metrics of greatest predictive, greatest predictive value and comparative analysis and with this I'd like to close and again express my gratitude to the organize, organizers for allowing me to be part of this exciting project. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Zadi, so we're going to have a show of Please, go ahead. Dr. Narula has questions. Sorry, I told you when the sister is here, I don't open my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I mean, uh, excellent, uh, excellent presentation. And uh, Dan and I are sitting here and admiring the way you presented it. And uh, so, there is no question about the vulnerable patient. Nobody will question that. That vulnerable patient is the most important thing to follow. It is all about risk factors. And once you know about the risk factors, we really know about the disease. But when we talk about the vulnerable class, there is a fundamental problem that we are suffering from. And uh, there are two papers which we just put out, one in JAMA Cardiology, June 16th issue, and second one was in the July issue of Circulation Research this year, where we said that the problem is not having a vulnerable class, problem is freedom from the vulnerable plaque, which is more important. So negative predictive value of a plaque which is not vulnerable is very high. And the positive predictive value of any way you image a plaque, your positive predictive value is very low. And that was in the editorial which Sanjay Kaul and I put into Jack uh, last year. And uh, so what, what we tried to show there was that when you talk about the negative predictive value, of a stable plaque, it ranges between 94% to 99.8%. And if you look at a positive predictive value, the best you do is with CT, where you have uh, 22 times, uh, 22, uh, 45 times higher likelihood of having an event in the next uh, two years' time, or 10 times higher likelihood of having an event over the next 10 years. Now, if you look at the PAM data, very clearly tells you that if I have angiographically done 
decision versus FFR done decision. FFR performed 40% better than uh, the, uh, the angiographically done uh, decision. Now, when I do it, this is by patient. When I look at by lesion, there is no difference in angiographic uh, uh, MI, which was 3.9% versus FFR decided lesion, which was 3.7%. So significance being uh, no, not significant. However, when the FFR negative lesion was seen, there was only 0.2% like you would have having an event. Two out of 1,000 people would have an event if FFR was negative. On the other hand, if FFR was positive, you will have to do 100 angioplasties to save 8 minutes. Okay, now you go from there to prospect. Prospect has 697 subjects, 3.4 years follow up. And if you look at 0 vulnerable feature, 1, 2 and 3 vulnerable feature. 0 vulnerable feature, 0.3% likely. <clears throat> One vulnerable feature, 5% likelihood. Two features, 10% likelihood. Three features, 20% likelihood in 3.4 uh, years. Mm -hmm. Now, how many people out of 3,000 lesions had, uh, had uh, uh, three, uh, three features? 29. So, 1% of the people have that. Of that, one-sixth have an event. What is the positive predictive value in the tank? Right? On the other hand, negative predictive value, 0.3% over the next 3.4 years. So it is the negative predictive value which is important. Why? Because the positive predictive value has lots of problems. Number one, our CT study with a 10-year follow-up clearly shows that if I have two scans, two things which really make a difference, not only the high-risk threat, but if it is stenotic, seven times higher likelihood. So stenosis plus iris. And if in two CTs are done at an interval of one year, which was 500 cases out of 3,000, and if plat shows progression over the next one year, 37 times higher likelihood of having an event as compared to the plat, which is not showing anything. So it is the dynamicity of the disease which is important. Is the plaque enlarging? And is it enlarging because of the lipid core rather than anything else? So, there is a significant positive predictive value issues here. And that too, Dan and we have correct, uh, uh, are doing this stuff uh, together now, where we are trying to demonstrate that FFR also is not determined <coughs> alone by the QCA. It is not determined at all by the lesion length. It is determined by the QCA and the amount of lipid pore sitting outside the plant. Lipid core sitting outside the plaque has a higher multivariable contribution to the FFR and that is the reason that FFR picks up the disease better than the NGR. And I tell you, I normally show a very small uh, clip where uh, an Italian uh, farmer is uh, relaxing in a farm and uh, there is a donkey which is sitting next to him and uh, there is a person who comes on a Vespa and he says, sir, do you have time? And uh, he picks up donkey's ball and says, uh, yes, 15 past 10. So he says, sir, are you sure? He picks up balls again and he says, 15 past 10. So he fixes his watch and goes. In the evening, he returns back and he wants to test him because he's still intrigued. So he says, sir, do you have time? He says, again? He says, yes. So he picks up donkey's ball again and he says, 10 past 7. Damn, it is 10 past 7. Sir, how do you figure out the time by picking up donkey's balls? So he picks up donkey's ball, shows there is a village club behind there. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I tell people is that FFR is, FFR, FFR is donkey's ball. <laughs> and the village club is the pathology. Until unless you have a pathology, you don't have an abnormal physiology. Right? So, if you really have to pick up <coughs> something, the only way to do that is looking at pathology also in addition to it, but yeah. you have to demonstrate that the region is dynamic. Unless the region is dynamic, you are not going to pick it up. So, the best way of identifying a subject is, this guy is not going to die. That's all. 
not that this guy is going to die. Well, this is really fascinating because you just tied this to the power of zero discussions that we had in coronary calcium. And after so many years of discussions of using calcium to identify risk, now using zero to eliminate those people who uh, don't. So you're basically creating the power of zero version of angiography. Uh, but the challenge that Dr. Zade is trying to bring our attention is that, you know, there are a lot of people who are not going to have an event. Finding people who are not going to have an event, how is it going to help us with finding people who are going to have an event? So your short answer is, we don't have the resolution or the predictive power to do anything in that area. Is, is that your fundamental? Yeah. Any comment here? I'm going to go back to Dr. Zadi see if he has anything. Anybody else? Any comment? I'm sorry. I, I didn't, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to hear all of Jagat's uh, comments. I heard just... Uh, something about prospect and FFR and, uh, and uh, I have uh, strong feelings about these, these studies. <laughs> in, 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 general, in general, let me, just, let me just say in general, one of these issues are, is with all these, these many studies out there uh, that they're using very, very different endpoints uh, and, and that often leads to confusion in, in many of the FFR studies uh, looking, looking at, at, at Evascularization, hospitalization, and uh, we don't compare heart events uh, in where they really, where, as far as I know, really don't have any stronger predict predictability compared to atherosclerotic disease burden. I mean, the prospect study similarly is very, I believe, widely misunderstood because it shows indeed that there's a higher, if, if you have a higher individual. Uh, lesion plaque burden that you have a greater a greater risk of uh, events, but these events again they were all almost all of them were hospitalization for for angina uh, without evidence of an acute coronary syndrome, without evidence of myocardial infarction, uh, and, and in fact you know, obviously if you have a baseline, if you have a uh, a more advanced plaque, you know you will be likely to for that plaque to advance and follow up and to cause symptoms. So what really all prospect showed was that you that if you have a you know greater disease burden at baseline it will you know be more likely symptomatic at follow up. But it did not show that you can identify individual plaques which are associated with much greater likelihood of, of acute coronary syndromes and that's really the challenge and the challenge is really that the that the, uh, the the concept of um, acute coronary syndromes is so uh, complex uh, that it uh, that this, this single plaque imaging clearly is not enough. But um, uh, in uh, in an FFR, and obviously looks at a whole different uh, uh, issue altogether. You know, more, more blood flow uh, restriction, uh, and uh, there often the problem is if you have a higher FFR values, and you're also looking at uh, greater disease burden and stenosis severity. So these things are very difficult to dis disentangle. But I, overall, I, mean, I very much agree with uh, Dr. Narula uh, that uh, I mean, the, 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 that is very important to look at you know, the negative uh, predictive value. Thank you. I think uh, Dr. Narula really uh, put the final stamp on this. That the challenge is still on the table. We can lower our burden by addressing something that's easier to address, and that's, you know, when you have uh, non-vulnerable plaque for the specificity. I, we created this video, if you guys remember, 2003, and I think it's amazing that we're circling back to this. So I'd like to share this uh, one more time, uh, that we have uh, three elements of vulnerability.
So I think that uh, is still applicable, don't you think? It is still applicable. This was 2003. So I remember what, when we started. So really, I was reflecting on this. If you go to Shape website, please. I'd like to share with you. I before we came here, I emailed Dr. Brownwald and uh, told him the home page, please. Told him that uh, you know it was. No, it wasn't from LA. Yeah, it was. It's it's <laughs> yes. We had that uh, conference. There you go. This is it. This was it. If you go further down, this was further down. Right there. This is Dr. Bramwell. You were Cherry. Early, and everybody was there. I'd like to just go a little bit down. Just press here. And so just listen. This is 12 years ago. And I was telling Dr. Brownwald, what have you accomplished in 12 years? Hey, uh, Dr. Nagavi, Dr. Shah, a pleasure to be here. And um, uh, I want to make a few comments about uh, the way I have been thinking. Uh, it's not a unique way, but at least put together the way I've been thinking about identifying and managing uh, coronary risk in 2004. These are basically principles. So the first is that prevention of acute events has to be the primary goal in uh, cardiology. Treatment, uh, which we spend a lot of time on, and I've certainly spent many years in, in treatment, is locking the bond door after the horse is stolen. We have to recognize that. So prevention comes first and foremost. And as you heard uh, from uh, Jim Willerson, um, uh, the magnitude of the problem is really immense. But what Jim didn't say, that is a third of cases of sudden death and of acute MI occur in previously asymptomatic persons. And previously, until, oh, maybe 15 years ago, these were regarded as acts of God. No one knew where they came from. These people were suddenly struck down, often in the prime of life. Now we know, and this I think is one of the great advances in medicine in the last quarter of the 20th century, we now know that these are not acts of God, but these individuals usually have preclinical disease and or they have classical uh, risk factors, those that, that were identified by uh, Framingham or what we now call novel risk factors. And uh, the imperative is to identify high-risk asymptomatic persons prospectively ahead of time to provide intensive prevention. Um, <clears throat> All individuals who have clinically apparent atherosclerotic disease require intensive global risk factor reduction. That's a given. Um, but that's secondary prevention. Uh, some patients have unstable plaques, which I would call accidents uh, about to happen. And of course, these have to be identified. So this is my little pyramid. Everybody has this is the fashionable thing to have. Is I'll show you my pyramid, which you show me yours. <laughs> and uh, that's right. So this is my little pyramid, uh, which um, uh, takes patients. Uh, you know, at the base of the pyramid are individuals who have no apparent risk factors, and I think people would say that if you have less than one in two hundred chances of having an acute event in adult, or adult people, uh, a year, that would be defined as low risk. That doesn't mean that uh, that, uh, that couldn't become intermediate risk somewhere in the future. But we can't concentrate on that group now. Intermediate risk now is 0.5 to 2% a year. And I think that a lot of the uh, guidelines that the uh, European Society and Framingham have focused on the higher risk group, the 2 to 15, and I've added 
a very high risk group, uh, the more than 15 percent per year group. So, how to go about it? Now, uh, these are principles. The details, I think we can argue. We can argue about the details. So, the approach to the patient is some kind of clinical evaluation. And I don't want you to argue with me whether the Framingham risk score or whether the uh, Munster risk score, and there are a number of risk scores available, and what, how good is the Framingham risk score in Africa or not, but some clinical risk score. And for the moment, grant me the Framingham. And uh, some and uh, marker of inflammation. Um, Professor Masri is the first to uh, identify C-reactive protein. Uh, there are others, and I think they still need some sorting out, but let's begin with CRP. Let's look at cholesterol, obviously with fractions, as well as glucose. And that gives us the opportunity to do a first cut. And with this first cut, about 40% of American adults will turn out to be low risk, defined as less than half percent a year. That's the one event in 200 a year. And these are suggested to have lifestyle recommendations and follow-up. And that is follow-up to depend on the age. We have intermediate group, 0.5 to 2% a year. And that, for American adults, unfortunately, is about 50%, uh, even larger than the low-risk group. And uh, these, we think, I would suggest, require additional testing, I'll give you some ideas. And then there's a high-risk group, more than 2% a year. That's about 10% of the population. That squares with uh, the numbers that Dr. Wilson showed. And for sure, these need intensive global risk reduction. So um, what is the additional testing? It would be non-invasive uh, imaging uh, in an effort to identify patients who have vulnerable plaques. And uh, here are three methods. So we've done the clinical, and we have done the uh, obvious biochemical, such as glucose, cholesterol, uh, hemoglobin A1C, uh, C-reactive protein. And now we've identified a group that is at least at intermediate risk. And we have a series of non-invasive uh, uh, imaging uh, techniques or other tests. Actually, uh, the, uh, the uh, arterial brachial index is uh, the ABI is not an imaging technique, but it does give us further information about vascular disease. EBCT and uh, 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 intermomedial thickening of the carotids. Those techniques are available right now. And uh, in a patient uh, who was defined as being at intermediate risk, and if the, this further non-invasive imaging, uh, non-invasive testing is negative, then uh, they descend back into uh, low risk. But remember, they've been identified to have some risk factor. They may be, they may have hypertension, isolated hypertension, or uh, isolated LDL elevation, and they need risk factor reduction of a single risk factor. If the uh, uh, non-invasive testing indicates that they are high risk, then they need intensive global risk factor reduction and um, some non-invasive detection of unstable plaques. And uh, the uh, non-invasive detection of unstable plaques, I think, uh, uh, is the subject of this meeting, uh, or a major subject uh, for this meeting. And uh, I won't uh, preempt uh, what the techniques are, but I think that this is the group uh, in whom um, uh, such non-invasive detection. And if that's positive, and we're now getting into a very high risk group. These are the accidents about to happen. And I think 
at the present time, the present time, we need to think about going after these plaques with some invasive detection device. Again, these will be discussed here. So this is how you identify the patients who need the invasive detection. And now we're getting pretty close to the top of the pyramid. And uh, if we uh, find them and we're dealing with a population where the risk is in excess of 25% a year, and uh, now we come right smack up against what do we do? I think that there is a lot of work going on currently on novel anti-inflammatory compounds because uh, uh, the basis of uh, the, the unstable plaque is the important role of inflammation. Um, Antithrombotic therapy at a high level, and people are even talking about uh, bypassing unstable plaques that have been identified with surgery or multiple drug using steps. I wanted to segue to the last part. So this is 12 years ago. I think you agree that the premise really hasn't changed. That's exactly where we are. And in fact, we started SHAPE from that meeting, the SHAPE guideline. The difference was that we, we think that a larger population should get non-invasive imaging than that time. But the reason I wanted to get to the bottom, to the last part of what Dr. Brownwald said and the billion dollar question here is, I asked him, so what? What are you gonna do? Now you found this vulnerable plaque patient. And you know, he didn't hesitate. He said, uh, coronary artery bypass is on the table. Uh, this is an asymptomatic patient. You, you know, we, we don't have any. So I'm gonna throw the topic back to the chairwoman, chairman and co-chairman. Please <laughs> shed light. What is the answer to this question? We found the vulnerable patient. We developed this algorithm. What are we going to do with these people? You know what, uh, obviously, as you are saying, we still don't have the answer. And first of all, can I get this uh, clip from somewhere? Yes. <laughs> it's on the... It's on shape, the... yes. Okay. So uh, the most important thing that when you look at this data uh, and you go by the CT and geography, we have demonstrated that 22.5% likelihood of having an event in the next two years. But uh, when we look at the 10-year follow-up, the risk is approximately 18%. So we are not quite there, what uh, Dr. John Walt wanted, 25%. 25%. Unless you are able to pick up 25%, you will not be able to justify a patient to come on a table and do something that you have one in four chance of dying in the next uh, 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 12 months. A uh, couple of years or something like that. So unless uh, the 25% that he's coming to is in the next one year, because he converted all the framing and risk score from decade, he brought to, to one year. year. That's right. So if he's going to do that and he's wanting 25% in a year, nothing, nothing predicts that at this point in time. Unless we are able to look at the dynamicity and we are able to say, okay, it is not the high risk plan. It is a progressive plaque. If we are able to show that it is a progressive plaque, probably we might be able to reach there, but still we are not there, first of all. So we do not have a way to identify that positive predictive value what we expect, number one. Number two, putting in a stent might be still a possibility because I don't know how would, would I like myself to get open. But stent might be a possibility, but even before we go there, most important thing is now you have a PCS canine, which can squeeze you to 20 milligram percent of your uh, LDL. And after that, you probably might be able to bring that line back to, uh, to uh, close to uh, uh, zero mace rate from the primary intervention as well as secondary prevention. And Amit's uh, uh, yesterday's uh, presentation of uh, with Shaker Kathiration. Uh, that was the other Amit chair. It is not you? Your stature in my mind went 24 now, yeah. believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, that the uh, lifestyle changes. Uh, I mean, it is all about lifestyle changes. Yeah. Um, genetics may give you a risk, it risk factors, but it doesn't, doesn't give you the disease. Yeah. You know, and changing the, uh, so, 
that study was some yesterday uh, was presented. And uh, so, so the fact remains that at this point in time, I don't think we are there. You know, so his question. Twelve years ago, twelve years passed by. Few things changed. CRP is no longer as sexy as it was in 2004. Coronary calcium is a lot more evidence and solid than it was then. And but 25 percent were not there. In fact, that was my topic when I started putting the agenda with David. Uh, what would be the percentage? 50 percent, 25 percent. So Dr. Brown will put it on 25 percent. I want to go around the room and really suck everybody's brain because that was the purpose of this meeting, this $1 billion yeah, yeah, question. Yes, yes, please. Don't mind. Uh, we just put in a featured recent session for uh, ACC and uh, we have Chimane population from Bolivia. And uh, we have, uh, so we have looked at their carotid ultrasound as well as uh, we did the CDs on them. And uh, this is the tribal population. These are the same um, uh, hunter-gatherer uh, kind of a population which lives there, and uh, their LDL's, lifetime LDL is never been higher than 70 milligram percent. They have zero calcium scores, zero calcium scores. And uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, when we look at their CRPs, not HSCR, I'm talking of CRP, it ranges between 7 to 10. They have got thoracic calcifications, but coronary calcium is zero. So in my opinion, inflammation is not the way to go. CRP, what we are talking of, That's CRP right. is not causing any problem because coronary calcium, and that is all because of aortitis, uh -huh. which is because of tuberculosis, aortoarthritis, whatever else it is. But the coronary arteries are squeaky clean. 90 years old people, carotids, have no plaques. And this is a population study. Do you have so enough? We have done 750 CTs, 3,000 carotid ultrasounds. We build in the trucks there, and uh, it is an amazing population that we have worked on. Wow. And only reason, one, and that is their LDLs are uh, under 70. So we did a Texas population in Crawford uh, from here, Mr. Bush's pledge. And uh, we find that uh, at the 30 years of age, you start developing carotid disease. By 80 years of age, 100% people have been blacks quite like Dr. Booster's data from uh, uh, Netherlands and Denmark uh, from the HRP study, uh, not HRP, uh, bio. Uh, so then the next uh, 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 important thing, I went to my guru's town in uh, India. India. There the people are vegetarian, they are farmers, none of them is a smoker, they don't touch alcohol, non -vegeta uh, all vegetarians, and they meditate twice a day. Everybody is happy. <laughs> we did uh, 1100 ultrasounds in one day. Carotids. Okay? Because uh, they all collect for his birthday on 25th of uh, January, and there are approximately 20 million people collect there on that particular day. 20 million. So we were able to put in a camp and randomly did everybody who came in. So we had 12 stations, 24 hours we worked. The people from uh, Guinness uh, Book of World Record were there, so we made a world record on that day. For the maximum <laughs> number of carotid ultrasounds, maximum number of uh, blood draws, maximum number of screens. So we had four uh, records done on that day. But anyway, there the disease is postponed one and a half decade based on the carotids. And then we go to this Chimane population, disease has postponed three decades. Paper is in Lancet. So a strong correlation with the LDL? Only LDL. One thing. Wow. It's all LDL. Okay, let's see. Wow. <laughs> uh, okay, let's, we're going to go, and I'm going to, I'm not going to let anybody leave this room until we suck your brain, because that was the purpose of this question, because this is really, but Dr. Fusa really threw me in the hot water right there at the beginning. <coughs> what are you going to do once you find it? Dan, what were you? Part, so. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do when you find the vulnerable patient? Please. Well, first, I have to. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think medical therapy is terrific, so I think we have to do it without holding ourselves back from our aggressive patient. <clears throat> We're just starting to be getting raised on it, and we need to be much better. And I agree with. Uh, I, 
I, I agree with Jagger that, I mean, even ischemia by itself, that's not going to be enough. So even FFR or any of the testing we do for ischemia, that's not going to be enough. You have to show very medical therapy too. So the idea of it being a dynamic disease is something that we don't just take one point in time. You get aggressive with the medical therapy when you first find the disease. And whenever you find it, the more the disease, then you do more testing. If you find the disease, you get aggressive with medical therapy, and you have to recheck. And your concept, I don't know if we can afford it, but the concept of taking the patients who are at the elevated risk and then thinking of them with CTA that could be done not just one point in time, but at another point in time in the future. Quantifying the plaque, total plaque burden, the amount of calcified plaque, non-calcified plaque, lipid content plaque, and then finding out are these plaques getting worse is the way to go. Then when you have a patient failing medical therapy, worsening of the plaques, that's when bypass surgery becomes part of the equation. So, I think you get a high enough risk, it's probably not going to be focused <coughs> treatments. If it's really, really high risk, failing all this, progressive disease, bypass the disease completely, and then keep your patient with LDL. So, we'll do it. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 But there's an additional concept here, because right now we all consider the possibility that you might have cancinumab, might have trexate, and a whole host of other medications that aren't so benign. And so we might need additional information before we want to have the cost and contact profiles of some of these additional medications. And if those then fail, then we can think about the even more aggressive surgical interventions. And I remember at the same meeting, somebody was talking about thinking more along the lines of oncology. Or that's exactly what they do. They, they look at patients, they see the response to medications, the progressive, then they come in with the big guns, you know, for more aggressive therapies and maybe surgery. And you know, hopefully we could be able to do that down the line. The other thought that I that I had earlier on when Dr. Kuster was talking was about the education component. And I think the most impactful therapies, especially in primary prevention, would be diet, stress, and lifestyle changes that are incredibly challenging to, to teach. And so I, I usually don't think in terms of the challenge of, of education educating the patients uh, along those lines, but his point was actually very well taken. That, that is a, an incredible challenge. And maybe technology could help us. Maybe they'll you know, gamify some kind of approach to the, to the patients over the long term and have some kind of engagement. But that, that should be part of what shape looks at. But that challenge, you know, just look at obesity, weight problem. Yeah. I mean, we have all kind of education in the past 20 years, and we doubled our weight. Almost like that, you know, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. So it's just not really just the education. No, no, I'm not sure about that. Well, I, I, I think we are somewhat potentially <clears throat> complicit because we taught patients that they should shift their diets, and they ended up shifting their diets, and they ended up having a more of a sugar-rich diet, and yeah. that contributed to that same problem that we're talking about. So maybe we just need to think in terms of a different strategy. Uh, maybe we should spend more of our time thinking about diet and some other aspects and education. Thank you. Zahi? Yeah, I, mean, I, I want to echo Ahmed's comment on the aspect of how important these lifestyle could <clears throat> be. A different approach needs to be taken. Actually, Dr. Fuster mentioned you know, some of these in the past, the aspect of, you know, you need, like what we have done is in smoking and how we were able to fight smoking the government being and, and a lot of these things, you know, if you talk about diet and the aspect of you know, the type of food people have access, it's hard to teach the, the, uh, the patient the subject. But it has to come a little bit you know, from, from above and intervene on programs. That, you know, if you look at in Northern Europe, right, there's a lot of programs uh, stimulating, in a sense, lifestyle modification in Norway and in Denmark. And, where, you know, maybe your insurance gets less because you are exercising and you're able to demonstrate this. Um, so I think maybe that kind of approach probably is going to be. Uh, you mean policy making? Policy. Social level exactly. po 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 policy. That, that, that's something that we haven't done. It's I have a question, uh, David. Can I ask you this question? 
it was brought up in the discussions about the new guideline, USPS, uh, TEF, and that is statin caused some level of complacency in the population. When people take a statin, they falsely think that they're protected and they're not taking diet seriously. And there was one study even showed that it uh, caused increased weight. Is that your understanding? Sorry. This week I read the US PDF guidelines. But yes, uh, there, there is fairly good evidence that when people start taking statins, that their diet is less good and they gain weight. There, there is evidence to support that for sure. And I've been the I'll, I've been thinking about what Dr. Brewster said, and um, and you know his, his message was pretty clear. Uh, yeah, this is all fine and good, but it's not going to make a difference. Is what he said. He can do cold water. It was pretty cold. Yeah, he does that to me all the time. Yeah. In this meeting, he comes here and throws, and then we're just trying to crawl back up. But I think. That's the cold, the cold shower out to really, uh, Absolutely. Like Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, this is a challenge. There's no doubt. But my point to Dr. Fuster was that once you tell somebody you're going to die in the next 12 months if you don't do anything, there might be some more psychological effect. I mean, you're saying no? I, I, I frame it a little bit differently than uh -huh. my spirit. I'm putting together different things I've heard. So, first, we're talking about primordial prevention. Having good health and preserving it because your LDL stays low over a lifetime. Yeah. And, and that, that's one aspect of it. What you're talking about is identifying these super high risk people with a 50% one year or two year risk. To me, I'm a parental cardiologist. Every patient sees my nutritionist, exercise physiologist, but it's a little too late to do that alone at that point. We know that we look ahead, higher risk people, lifestyle alone did not do it. So at that point, it's not sufficient to do that in a very high risk person where that's the only thing you're doing. And I think that's when we get. Creative, I think, where you, whether it's PCSK9 for one year or two years or three years, whether it's something, you know, more aggressive uh, from that perspective. So I think we're, we're sort of talking about two different aspects. One mm -hmm. is primordial prevention, uh, preserving good health, lifetime, lifelong uh, uh, preservation of low LDL. But for whatever reason, if you end up with a super high risk, if we're able to use machine learning and identify in a very short amount of time, I Think of lifestyle alone based on <clears throat> definitely it's, well, not, it's not. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying don't do lifestyle. Yeah. I think it's complementary. Yeah. But but similarly, you wouldn't take. You know, I think what Dr. Fuster was saying is in freedom. These people. We didn't say don't take a statin. They 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 the data suggests are high enough to warn it. Your 50% says this is the person who should get it, but they wouldn't put it in their mouth. Only 20% would take the pill. And I think that's the adherence part of that. I'm not sure that if you scare someone and say, boo, they're going to put it in their mouth anymore. Um, but their doctor at least says, this is someone I identified, I might not have before. So this is. Well, I think I'm going to go back to the analogy of cancer. David, you go ahead first. Okay. Well, um, it might be sort of rambling, but I'll, I'll, I'll get there. So, is it valuable, would it be valuable <coughs> to be able to identify someone at such high risk that? we could predict a 50% chance in the next year that they're going to die. And, and, you know, I think that that would be a, a good contribution. I think that that would be useful. Um, would it really change how we practice? And I, I think the example of somebody hospitalized for an acute coronary syndrome who within a year has a 50% chance of still being on a statin who, uh, I don't know what the statistics are for a smoker to stay abstinent, but you know, the statistics are, are pretty crappy for somebody who has been told with a symptom that they have a very high percent chance uh, of of dying within the next year. But that's not as more than 10, 15 percent now. You know, we put them on, you know, aggressive therapy after the event. And uh, my point was that trying to 
to bring this primary prevention close to cancer and what we do in cancer, once you find somebody with tumor and you know the survival for 12 months is 50% and so on, you in cause some action. Now, if what I mean said, if the treatment is all about what they do in a lifestyle change, obviously it's not enough. But if we develop new interventions, like what Dr. Bramwell says, if it is more than 25% or if it's 50%, it justifies a bypass, then I think we can make a difference because now we have new tools that we could not use before. And so that's the point. And obviously we have to have trials for those. And because there's such a short time, by definition, such a short term, we should be able to do a lot of trials because it only takes six months or a year to see the outcome if, you know, that it all comes back to these computer guys to develop that 25% <laughs> and 50% machine learning algorithm. But once developed, the question is what we're going to do. Uh, you know, you, you answer some of the question. I asked some of the cardiologists that were not here from Shape Group, you know, here are some of the answers. I would carry a Automat, uh, automated defibrillator in my car. I will start on a PCSK9 inhibitor right away. I won't commit to aggressive exercise or uh, vigorous activity because of the uh, stay away from cold. All of those traditional triggers that we know from you know textbook. Uh, take my vaccine, flu vaccine. Uh, definitely teach my uh, wife, husband, and family members CPR, and alert them uh, about my, you know, health. I'm much more conscious if I have some kind of vague pain or indigestion and so on. I'll call 911 right away. These were quite answers that I received by email from a number of people who, you know, basically said, if you tell me that you have a machine that accurately identifies risk of 25%, I said 50% in the next 12 months. Uh, but, you know, these are all going to be uh, personal, anecdotal until we have trials done. But I think if you are able to detect risk that high, that short amount, it justifies doing trials so you will be evidence-based uh, medicine. So I'm going to make sure to go around Michael. I agree with what everyone said, including what <coughs> just in terms of separating out. The two groups. But I just want to, I guess, in addition to agreeing with everyone, including what Dan says, how good my medicine is, is to remind ourselves that we're also fighting against the epidemiology of the disease here, which is going down. It's been a tremendous decrease in CBD over 20 to 50 years. I beg the difference, right there. There's no question about it. That's, that's clear. Age adjusted yeah. yes but that's what epidemiologists love to do but i'm just saying that society wise it didn't go down but to find your 50 percent risk patient when you know secondhand smoke is going down and trans fats are going down and, and diets in general getting better people on statins and awareness about it's mean, exceedingly hard you're fighting against the epidemiology to try to find this person because you're talking about prevalence yeah. not talking about incidence incidence is going down to find that person with really that 50 percent risk it's going to be, it's, it's hard. I, again, sure I, I, I say adjusted incidence, age-adjusted incidence is going right. down. Incidence is not going down. Incidence is going down. Prevalence is not going down. Right. Because because the top population is getting older. That's correct. You're talking about incidence. You're talking about a rate of disease that's that high over one year. I'm just saying it's, it's going to be hard to find... The, the level of risk that you're talking about, I think. But oh, you're saying it's good? Well, I mean, the, 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 the epidemiology is saying that the incidence is going down. It's so going down, but it's still... We're trying to find someone with such a high one-year incidence that would justify some other, despite how good medicine is getting, despite we are getting, learning a lot more about... Right, but, but, we, but we had 600,000, but we had 600,000 uh, uh, STEMI last year. Right, the denominator is getting bigger, too. So... Don't we want to find them before a semi? Yeah. No question. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm echoing, I guess, a lot of what I've heard, but 
the challenge of it, but I think the epidemiology is points to the fact the challenge is, is very, is very, very hard. With the epidemiology approach, meaning primary prevention and diet and so on, that is slow to get what shape one to do eradicate a heart attack, we'll have to go another 100 years to get to you know, eradicate. That's right. I'm just saying that in terms of finding, and I guess we turn from 50 to 25, maybe extend it a couple of years, but to find a person that's really that high of risk in the modern era with the environmental exposure to medicines, I just think it's extremely challenging. Okay. You know I'm yeah. It's it, not an easy task. No, no, it's not easy. We don't have the tool right now. We don't have the tool. My point is, all of those people are going to fall off the cliff in the next 12 months and be STEMI or MI. If we detect them a few months before, the accident <coughs> would be the high risk, like so the very high risk. too high a bar with, with the model that we're talking about right uh -huh. now, where we're thinking about intervening with bypass surgery. And we're thinking about a 50% one-year risk. That's, that's an unreasonably high bar. We're, never, we're not going to get there anytime soon. It's going to be another 12 years or maybe 24 years. It's going to be a you long mean, time. You mean we're not going to be able to develop the tool that predict not, the not such over, a short? Realistically, not over the next five years. But instead, we do have intermediate goals that are realistic. And with those intermediate goals, uh, lower level of risk, we could up titrate or down titrate medications, a more complex group of medications than simply aspirin and statins. So we still have an opportunity to impact care but we should change the paradigm a little bit. We're, we're not thinking of such a high bar that requires uh, you know, transplant. Well, I mean, I, I was just trying to make a draw an analogy with cancer. Yeah. What do you do when well, you find a tumor? Works. You're, you're still working with intermediate risks. It's not a stage four cancer. I mean, we're, we, we don't have to limit ourselves to the highest risk, but we can deal with intermediate risk groups where our expanded group of medications requires some more thoughtful development of, of how we're going to Maybe more population closer to the middle of the uh, pyramid. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I tell you that uh, what Ahmed is saying, I'm like, it is, it is extremely important that we, we must realize this. Uh, uh, I distinctly remember when I was back in uh, as general, one of the uh, transplant patients that I was doing by transplant fellowship. The patient was there for four months, and that time we did not send them home. We used to keep them on glutamine and dopamine in, in, in house. And we would not send them home. Elvac had not come with all those things I'm talking about the previous age. But uh, this guy, four months, he was green, actually. His uh, bilirubin was 21 and uh, with heart failure. And uh, was being nursed there. Got a heart, seventh day. First question is, when can I smoke? Um. You know, I mean... Am I yeah. totally ballooned apart? And now the first thing that he's asking is when can I smoke? Yeah. You know, it is it is a problem. You have the patient with the, the IV drug of user, infective endocarditis, the patient is saved, and the moment he gets back home, the first thing he starts doing is the so question is it is essentially what Dr. Fuster says. He says the only time you can impress a person is when he's between three to five years old. Why? You have got multiple centers in brain. They don't have the connection still. You have centers. You don't have the connection fiber, there, which are mature. Yeah. Once the connection fiber start coming in, the person starts thinking. He starts using his logic whether right. I should be eating it or a little bit I can eat and then. So you have to start impressing on these guys right from day one that you know what? You don't have to eat this. You don't have to eat that. And that is why his, all the data that he produces from Columbia it clearly shows that these three to five years old kid, you teach them for six months, their knowledge, attitude, practices, they all improve. You stop the teaching at six months, it continues to improve. In teachers, it improves in parallel because they are also listening to the lectures. But then at six months, when you stop, they become flat. In parents also, they come home and they tell their parents, it is improving, and six months later, it starts to fall. You know, so we are incorrigible. Yeah. Yeah. So question is that if we have to go and his mantra today is education, education, education. Right? And yeah. education, early enough. Again, yeah. now the question is what do we do to scare the people? Now that we have to see whether whether we can make same scare as cancer. 
Dude, I don't know why people are scared more of cancer than they are. What? No, there is a reason. <coughs> they know they're going to die. They know the moment that you tell them you got a tumor, in stage two or three, they know it is death. Coronary disease is not. I mean, with epidemiology, what we know, you know, 300 out of 100,000. That's the, you know, 600 out of 100,000. Even that does not. But when you look at, compared to cancer, when you tell them you're going to die, chances of one out of two, one out of three, you cause a lot of things. Their adherence to treatment, they, you know, they adhere to chemo, which is the worst therapy they get. So I was trying to draw things that we've, we've talked in the other, so let's refer to uh, Amit's category, the first and second. In the first category, we've done everything in the past 30 years, unless we have a more intensive acting drug like PCSK and CHEAP and so on. I can't think of anything else. But in the second category, if you are able to identify the vulnerable patient and draw this analogy like cancer, that the tumor that knows that person knows is going to die or have a major, you know. Okay, let me do a, a quick analysis. PSA. There was a slide when I presented that our proposal to uh, Google. If you look at PSA in the United States, the spread or the incidence and prevalence of metastatic prostate cancer was going up like this. In 19, I think 60, some 70, when PSA was detected, there is a sharp decline in metastatic prostate cancer. I would like to draw an analogy metastatic prostate cancer to STEMI and MI. If you are able to find a PSA and we are able to admit it population level, I predict that we're able to get a significant number of the MI and the STEMI down in that population. This is a hypothesis. We don't have the tool yet, but if IBM Watson or Google or Facebook, if they want to come in, and if we are able, we already put together the cohorts, you know, that we have, we have now 23 cohorts from Framingham, Mesa, European, all that. And we get people who died or had an event a few days to a few months, maximum 12 months after their blood drop and their exam. And feed every day that we can get from these to the machine learning. These are the vulnerable patients. They just had a blood drop, coronary calcium, or other clinical and parking contact. So we, we, we put these expected numbers based on the data that we got, like from Raymond Erbel from HNR. That's, I, that's, I think, what you should be working on now. That's you what should, we're working on. You should curate, you should be curated also. You know, the data needs to be curated. So we're, we're meeting, <laughs> yes, yeah, Zai, we're, what, I mean, that's what we should be working yeah, on. Yeah, Zai, now. we're meeting with uh, IBM Watson next month. But, but IBM Watson is, is the tool, but you no, have no. the data. They don't have the data. No, 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 no. Funding to oh, go okay. to go to all of these blood samples. David and Stanford will be the collecting. <laughs> the court money. The coordinating centers to the collecting samples and so on. This note, I think, we should yeah, the meeting. That's exactly that's exactly what we're. Here. Let me ask uh, Harry, epidemiologist, population scientist. And cardiovascular. Tell me what you think. Is it possible to go and replicate something like PSA and prostate cancer with what coronary disease? Uh, so, uh, so I guess first of all, it's of course not an or or, so it's all plus plus plus. Eh? So the primordial, primordial prevention, the screening, and trying to do this is is simply crucial. I mean, in this field. Uh, you, with the three things together, you can really do, do a good job, and you are already doing a good job. Um, um, so yeah, if you, if you can find a test that uh, predicts uh, mortality in the next uh, two years or so, 
I think, except for people that don't want to know when they are dying, uh, for the many other ones, you, you have very good therapy. So, so it would be it would be really crucial. Of course, in this respect, I, I would imagine that the calcium scoring is such a good test at the moment mm -hmm. that you should come up with with something very very mm -hmm. good to to beat to beat the with to complement yeah or <clears throat> complement or, or whatever. Um, but I think it's a, it, 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 it's a, it's a good initiative. Yeah. Thank but, you. Well, I'm, a bit, no. I'm a little bit skeptical. I want to come back to what uh, Jan had said. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we talk about the test, whatever the test would look like, uh, and I mean, he, he mentioned the patient You identify uh, I mean, uh, a more and more specific but uh, small population, and still the vast majority in that one, zero events. Um, well, with this, uh, with this specific criteria, even the, the, event, but the vast majority of them I still came from those who did not have those. So uh, I'm, I'm a little skeptical. You, you're you're, you're skeptical about skeptical. finding one single test? Yeah, I am with you 100%. Complex, I, I don't think we will be able to find a, a PSA. What I, what I think we should be able to, to find is a combination of that vulnerable patient uh, plaque, can go back to, can go back to the circle. plaque, blood, and myocardium. If you're able to draw something that combines these three and whatever other information, obviously age and all the things here, machine learning, again, this is not something that you and I are going to come and sit down and put a, a, a you know, binary score. This has to be done with you know huge processing ability and the unique type of data set that we just talked about those people who have had an event a few days to a few months but obviously uh, you, you also have to adapt these uh, approaches to the different scenarios that you have talked about i mean you go from primordial prevention uh, to these very very high risk patients i mean these are totally different scenarios so but we're not going to change the primordial that's already there i think harry just said that then I mean, we need to have multi uh, prompt approach that will stay the society level, even Dr. Fuster's approach to home and family based education has to be there. There all has to be there. What we are trying, you know, past 15 years focusing is the identification of the vulnerable patient people who are right close to the cliff and they're just blindfolded and they just fall and we don't have any way to identify them. And, Cholesterol and other risk factors are not cutting. The so, problem yeah. is that we will have to screen uh, go to a very big population, population to get a very small result. That is our problem in this uh, whole issue. For example, I tell you, we presented one paper in um, ACC this year, and then we just completed a survey based on that, uh, which we submitted for this coming year. This was uh, the women who went for their mammography. I don't know if you tap yes. on that. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. Now you do the mammography and you find uh, the breast arterial calcification yes. in there. And this Khurram, Khurram was here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he left. Yeah. So, yeah. so Khurram did an editorial on it, fabulous editorial that he, he wrote. So the uh, 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 approximately 40%, uh, uh, 42% of women had breast arterial calcification. That was a biased, biased sample. Mm -hmm. The reason being that we picked up only those who had mammography done as well as a CT uh, scanning, I mean CT of lung done. So we did the ungated calcium uh, scores. And uh, we find out that 47% uh, of those women, and these are all 40s and 50s, you know, where you would not do any kind of a test in these women, right? 47% of them have concomitant coronary artery cancer. So Khurram did the analysis on it and beautifully written that we do approximately 40 million mammograms a year, right? Out of 40 million, even if we say that this was an absolutely biased population, four times biased population, at least we have 10% of them who have a likelihood of having calcium in their coronary artery, which otherwise we would have never thought in these women. Well, right? you already answered so that question. So you have now 4 million women, right? Every year, who are likely to have uh, the uh, coronary calcium? Okay. 
and now what do we do with these women? So basically, we will tell these 4 million uh, women that okay, you go ahead, I mean 10%, so out of them 47% have, so 2 million women. What do you do? You change their lifestyle? Now, I, th I think you just you just made the argument. You just said <coughs> we're trying to do multiple ways to identify them. Right. But according so, to so I tell you. So today we did the uh, we submitted the uh, the late breaking abstract today for uh, ACC. We find out that 85 percent of them said that they want to be informed and they would like to find a remedial measure. Now I don't know how far would it go. How many of them will accept it? What change would it bring? I have no idea. But they want to be informed. I think that's a great movement. I mean, that's a great step up. We should put that in national policy. Like FDA, CDC, take this as a guideline. National policy. I mean, we, we, we were just talking about that, that to make a change, meaningful change, it has to be multifactorial. <coughs> and so social impact and social education and, and guidelines and policies are one of them but you know the shape group said collectively that the first cut should be knowing if you have zero coronary calcium or you have a lot of calcium because that will give us a good starting point and then from there we build on whatever machine learning tells us guide us that adding these 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 will bring you to that you know, that threshold. You know, late uh, George Diamond and Sanjay Cole, after our shape guideline would be issued, they did the analysis. They actually said we need to screen about 48, 49 million people. But it's not every year. First year we do this, we get a cut, and then every five years, we would do it. So they did a very beautiful analysis. And back then, they said it's not cost effective because they put in their cost $400 for coronary cows. I think Dan can testify here that we can do that with $8,200 to $100 now. And if you put $8,200, to $100, it would be significantly more cost effective, truly cost effective. So. You know, our approach is, this is the mammography of men, kills more men than, you know, breast cancer killing women. It should go to national guideline. It should become a care, a standard of care. You get your coronary calcium, you know where you are. Now we're working on finding the vulnerability factors that maybe you were honest and Piotr and other people looking into calcified vulnerability or vulnerable calcification, it might even be, be able to improve that one even further. We're just looking at the great Addison score, right? We haven't made any improvement in that one. So if you add those incremental, we can very likely reach that 25%, uh, Dr. Brownwald, or, or even more. And once there, I think we will reach the holy grail. We will reach that era that we've been chasing for 20 years now, 50 years, that we turn these people to like cancer, tumor. Now we got to do something aggressive and try to serve while we're doing all other things, just societal levels and so on. I want to go to Erling Falk, the father of plaque rupture. Erling? Yeah. What? I don't think I can say so much that has not been already said, but uh, you mentioned uh, our uh, uh, our vision was to identify, to find the vulnerable people uh, and treat them uh, before they got the heart. We are in the we are talking on primary prevention, not the people that already they are asymptomatic. Yes. And uh, what have we achieved in the last uh, 15 years or something? What we, we yeah, what have we achieved in that that, that aspect? We have talked about coronary calcification. Yeah. We have talked about carotid ultrasound, but uh, in fact they may improve risk assessment. But even heavily calcified coronary will not come close to a, a risk of 50, 25 percent of 15 yeah. in one year. So we are talking about something else. 
I think we can do risk assessment better, and I think uh, we, we should be able to improve it beyond the traditional framing of risk factors. And uh, with the uh, new tools available and, and, and uh, detecting multiple biomarker and uh, 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 just the uh, machine. Uh, and machine learning, we will be able to do better risk assessments. But I don't think we come close to in an asymptomatic person with identify one that have uh, 25 percent. One out of four will have an event in the next 12 months. No, I don't believe. Well, we're going to have to make yeah. you believe it. So <laughs> we're going to have to show you. But, but, but I think you would, of course, yeah. we should be able to do risk assessment better yeah. than we are doing. So it, 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 Ernie, imagine we yeah. have, but, there, imagine we have 2,000 vulnerable but, patients from this 20 some cohort. Mm -hmm. These are people who died or but, had an yeah, event. But, but you, and, you assume there is a signal. What? You, say, you assume there will be a signal present in these people yeah. that are I just have, to have uh, yeah, no, well, you're right. My maybe, philosophy maybe is, it just it's not earthquake, Erling. No, it's I, not earthquake. I think about earthquake. Yeah, yeah. remember? Think about earthquake. We, 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 yeah. We, had a, we had a motto when we yeah. started vulnerableflag.org. Mm -hmm. Heart attack is not an earthquake. It can be predicted, therefore mm -hmm. prevented. This was 17 years ago, with, with mm -hmm. our, in our first week. Unfortunately, we haven't cracked this code yet, but I really believe that with all the things that we have seen, you know, have you said, have, have, how many of you guys have you driven Tesla on driverless mode? I did, and I was frightened on highway, completely driverless, and I was texting. If, if that much advancement could be made in last five years, less than 10 years, with machine learning, all these genius approaches, we can do that. We have to, it's our job to bring that to our field. So I think with this unique subset of data that we're putting together, we have the opportunity. Okay, sorry, you go ahead. So I haven't introduced myself because I got it here late. My name is Marcio, I'm from Brazil, from the University of Sao Paulo. I work with the other cohort with Mark, Mike is also involved. I'll just challenge you on that. Uh, we're good enough to drive cars, but we're still pretty bad at predicting when it's going to rain in seven days. So there's just some stuff we can't predict very well. Some that should be quite simple. Uh, I mean, so, about, so yeah, you're like, saying we cannot predict hurricane? We predicted hurricane no, 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 this year. We predict rain. Oh, rain. rain. Is, is it well, rain? I mean, I don't one, th thing, one thing is the, the shorter term it is for, for like weather, it's, it's easier. And the more window of time you have, it's also easier. So I think we're in good shape with most of the scores we have to talk about, like a 10 year. So within a 10 year range, I have enough time to some of the random things he's talking about. It's eventually will happen and we can do. But I think our power to get on the, on the closer range enough to predict like a year or two is way tougher. And the truth is, what kind of, which signs we have this far? of like really high risk predictors uh, that we've seen that are not rare. We don't. What we have sometimes it may be uh, napkin ring or the three high picture, high risk feature that we see on, on IVOS or OCT. Those are like a one, two, three, five percent of the population. So if we want to trim that to have this top of the pyramid, zero point something percent, we might be able to do it at the expense of what Jagged said a huge number of screening Screen. to find this part, but is it really worth it? Is, is this really what we want? Or should we aim somewhere like longer term, somewhat lower risk, more intermediate and say, yeah, we're going to handle the 20% 10 year and focus on that. And even more, what I think we should do, keeping that on, on one track, is the other side of finding the lower risk from what we're doing wrong and stop treating people we don't need. And then we go on the, the risking from the calcium score zero and other strategies that we say, we can find people where we're kind of sure it's not gonna happen in somewhat a longer term. And we're, I think we're better off finding the safer side than the higher risk. And that would go, like if you get that JAMA paper, I think Jack is one of the co-authors on, on JAMA cardiology, where they talk about the, the amount of uh, obstructive disease you have prior to NMI. And it's, pretty flat, stable up until three months before. And then at three months, you say that goes from 30 to 60, 70%. So there is something acute that is nonlinear, abrupt, 
that happens at some point, and their their reference is something three to six, three to twelve months. But it seems to be something abrupt, like a plaque rupture, and we're not really at, that good at predicting. So if we aim at that short period of time and try to get that event, unless we're on that period of time, we're not going to get it, and we're going to be wasting all the other measures that we could. Yeah. So should we should we aim at a one year, fifty percent, and shot everything at the guy that's close to that? Or should we think about 10 year something else intermediate and then be somewhat more yeah. aggressive in there? And but more than that, be more precise on that and kick out the ones we know or not. So we trimmed out to more precision. But more precision doesn't mean we're gonna get the 50%, just mean we're gonna kick out the ones we don't need and get somewhere in between. It might be more feasible, it might get less have, random have stuff in. Differently, but that's what we've been doing so far. It, it, it is, but I think there's still room to do that. We haven't been de-risking people for that long. Yeah, actually. but de-risking never is going to reduce MI. De-risking is a cost-effective argument. Yeah, it has it's also no... against harm. It's not just cost. It's right, right. I'm just saying it's not going to... And feasibility of doing If your goal is to, to eliminate 600,000... I, I think more deals are just done. Like, we can re-sense some very things. Okay. And, and I, I just... I, I mean, yeah, he's yeah. really analyzing it. And then one thing I was gonna, if, if we, if, if the idea is like we're gonna eradicate, then we need a good bunch of primordial prevention. And then I mean, I would just refer. One thing I like a lot, you just go North Korea the project. It took them 40 years, but they went from 40 pounds of butter per year per person to less than one. So then you have to go to cyber. And then I'll go to what Dan and, and Jagged said. It's not, and even with what you mentioned, it's not frightening the patient because, or, or the person. It's it's way beyond that. You need there's so, so much society around it. If you want to do primordial stuff, we're, we're talking about social behavioral science, which is from advertising to getting this. It's like here in the U.S., guys drive through to mail, to food, and to the yeah. bank. Yeah, it's it's just so simple. This is not gonna work. I'm, you make cities without sidewalks and like places like you go to LA, a block is two miles. That ain't gonna make. It doesn't matter how much you frighten people. That system doesn't work for what we recommend in terms of uh, you have to exercise. Okay. You have to walk to work. It's not feasible. So I think if, if we want to eradicate, we have a bunch more to do on the primordial part, but I think there's some room for the high risk, but I wouldn't aim to the very, very, very top end. I think we can step down a bit, assume there is some random stochastic thing that we can't predict, and that has to do with time. So if you give us a bit more time from the one year and a bit less risk, uh, then we have a bit more room to work and then target on people that were more okay. visible. And it, I, hear I think you. we should model a, yeah. a bit less than that. I hear I you. When, that, when we wrote this proposal to Google, one of the uh, preambles was that it's well known, and Dan Berman is a walking example, so is uh, David, because we, they, we, I watched it, that if you adhere to all of those low-risk behavior, from diet, Mediterranean diet, and all that, you can, eliminate, you can reduce the attributable risk to, let, in 97%, you can bring it down. But when you look at U.S. population, according to Enhance, do you know what percentage of U.S. population fall in that category? Is it 1%? No. Two, yeah, yeah, less than 3% of the entire U.S. population fall in that ideal risk category. American heart made fool of itself for the last 30 years but saying the same, same thing again and again. What is, what is going to change? I don't know, that, that's why what, what I echoed the, the North Korea project that you know, from, from Finland, where they had all things wrong, and they did like, it's, I think their last version of, I think it's global heart, there's a whole issue about 82% heart, uh, heart attack reduction. So it's 82% less coronary heart disease over 40 years, basically on risk factors. And there's some interesting data in there, because not only do they say it's 80% less, they, they, I think I think it's a BMJ paper of 2015 where they say if you somewhat we did in blood pressure, plus cholesterol, plus diet, plus exercise, and sum it up, what we got is more. So when you, when you do everything on the right direction, you can do even more than what you predict. There's a lot of and no. it, the thing is it works. 
There is I, I don't disagree point. with you. I'm saying but the thing we is, have we, walking you, examples. But if US, this U.S. hasn't been able to do yes. that thing also because of policy and the way yeah. the, the world is seen here, I'll say. Only three, less than 3% of U.S. population fall under ideal risk yeah. profile. And in Brazil, it's not but, that far but, better, I but, but I think that's a message to us as a, you know, scientists and academicians to wake up and stop dreaming that we can get 97% of people to that 3%. We have to change our approach. Otherwise, we're just going to get the same thing. No, I and agree. I don't disagree that population level, the rose approach, the, you know, epidemiology, but we really need to do now. I'm not saying we're going to be able to do this 25% with the same approach. I'm relying on you, honest, Piotre, IBM Watson, and our unique cohort that we have to draw something that we don't know. I'm not going with what we know, but no, we agree. don't know. When we come up with something, I mean, there's something happened to our patients. You just said that. Between three to six months, something happened. Yeah, that's a, I'm curious. I, I would expect we would find that out, but the truth is we haven't. Yeah. And the only true. But we never looked at it. No, 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 but it's I mean, everything we looked at. Every three month CT scans or. No, yeah, no, no, no. no, no it it the be. thing is. So, so the yeah. I, 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 I'm yeah. just going to counter the machine yeah. learning argument a little bit here because yeah. the data we have is not that good. We have a baseline measure. If you actually had heart rate variability on a per second basis for per minute blood pressure or stress levels on a continuous basis, I think it's possible. But we don't have any of that. But the stuff you that you're talking about there, all of those stochastic measures need exquisite data. And that's what you said over and over. Someone said that that shows the data going into the mouth. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's being we need way better data than what we have to do with your and even the beyond that when you look at uh, at least you're saying we need data. So that's exactly but what we need data that's not in the cohorts that exists. How do you know? I well, because only baseline measures, then brought someone back in a couple of years and just another If you get 2,000 of patients, I mean samples, of people yeah. who had an event within a few weeks and months, and you delve into their blood, their imaging, their clinical information, and you feed it into machine learning, do you think we'll learn more than what we have now? So yeah, I yeah, like your... I don't think we have sleep, I don't think we have stress, I don't think we have their... I think we're still missing the piece. It's, it's not... I don't think processing better the data we will have. We may not have health. physiologic data, but I think if you are able to get blood and do a thorough, I mean, you know that physiology is the end of the line. Between there are a lot I of proteins. The method, it's the data. I think, in my opinion, if you just have a baseline blood measure, still that's not going to help you. Not with one baseline blood measure, even but if, if you measure every single. Stroke. But but if that baseline was a few days before the event. That'll give you something. Sure, to do. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you for a couple days. I think you have that many. So, so, days, so some yeah. people think it's it's a couple mm -hmm. of months. Like uh, Dr. Bravo said, uh, uh, Italian uh, professor, he yeah, right. made a good argument that day. This is 12 years ago. That there is a wave going, and the uh, frequency or period of this wave is within three. Uh, or so month, you know, what's his name, forgot. So I, and then and she's on her, her website. I don't know what the wave is. When I talk to the um, micro RNA guys, they say a few days, exosomes and other things, you know, few, I, I, I don't know, but I, I think if there is a hope, it would go through this path that we're trying to dig this unique population. A few days before the event, a few weeks before the event, they were, uh, you know, in clinic. What the PMI guys are doing, taking all these, that's, that's the kind of data that we need. PMI? Precision oh, yeah, yeah, that 20 years from now. You, you're not going to be able to get. And maybe they can. Yeah. Okay, we're going to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Erling, can we give Erling the last word? Yeah. Thank you. Can we give Erling the last word? Sorry. Er Erling and Mark. What do you say? You have the last word. I just say if, if, if you manage to find an MR or a fingerprint that can predict a heart attack in the next half year, 
how do you how do you envision it should be implemented? It should all adults be tested every half a year to see what is the risk of having a heart attack the next half a year? I don't know. But it's an important question. Yes, it is a very important question. Yeah, it's it's absolutely. Yeah, but it doesn't it does that's why you that's why you always say that the pathologist always has the last word. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You told me was really right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we want to thank everybody online. I know there are quite a few people who are still online. We appreciate your tuning in. Uh, we will have all of these uh, video recorded online. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>